we're all assembled. So um, I'm going to call the meeting to order. You could have a roll call, please. Okay. Good afternoon, council members. Um, I'll go ahead and take the roll. Ms. Ehrlich? Here. Ms. Gibson? Here. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Here. Dr. Byrne? Here. Ms. Webster? Here. And Ms. Barvon? Here. We have a quorum. We'll now take public comment on items that are not listed on the agenda. Uh, speaker slips are available in the back of the room. If you'd like to speak, um, please hand them to Susan Morish. And um, for those that want to speak on items that are actually on the agenda, please also go ahead and fill out a speaker slip and note on that um, which agenda item you'd like to address. And that way you can be included in the discussion. Um, I'd also like to take this moment to remind everybody to please turn your cell phones to vibrate so that the meeting's not disrupted. I know there are people in here that are on call and that's lovely and great, but <laughs> I'll keep the, the cell phone noise to a minimum maybe. Is there anyone that wants to speak on items that are not included on the agenda? No. All right. So moving on, we'll go to agenda item three, the approval of the minutes from the last meeting of March 29th. So moved. All right. Um, so can I have a motion to approve the min minutes? So moved. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Great. Anybody, any um, additions to the minutes at all from anybody or changes? No? Seeing none. Um, can I have a motion to um, accept the minutes as they stand? That's... Yeah. yeah. Okay. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> the motion carries. Thank you. Any opposed? No. Okay. All right. So item number four is consideration of re revised regulations and possible recommendations to the full board. A presentation by Ms. Lowe. Thank you. Good afternoon. If you could uh, please refer to page 12 of your packets. You've been provided with a revised language for two different proposed regulations, one dealing with physician supervision requirement and the sec second, the practice of midwifery drugs and devices. The revised proposals are based on collaborative information provided by members of the public and the midwifery community during the March 29, 2012 Interested Parties Workshop. Recommendations were made at the Interested Parties meeting, were reviewed by legal counsel and other medical board staff, and the proposed regulation was revised accordingly. The first regulation we'll be discussing is the Physician Supervision Requirement 1379.23 of the California Code of Regulations. Business and Professions Code 2507F required the board to adopt regulations defining the appropriate standard of care and level of supervision required for the practice of midwifery by July 1, 2003. Due to the inability to reach a consensus on the supervision issue, the board identified separately this requirement in 2006 by adopting the standards of care for midwifery. Three previous attempts to resolve the physician supervision e issue via re legislation and or regulation have been unsuccessful. The proposed regulation for this section of the California Code of Regulations sets forth a collaborative approach to the issue of physician supervision by providing that the supervision requirement in law is met if the licensee established a collaborative relationship with a physician who agrees to provide guidance and instructions in the specified circumstances. The proposed regulation also provides that a business relationship is not created solely by a physician providing consultative services or by accepting a referral from a licensed midwife. The specific language is provided in your packets on page 13. Upon approval today, staff requests that the Midwifery Advisory Council recommend to the board that this matter be set for hearing and we ask for a motion. So I'll move. Second. Great. Is there, is there any committee input on the recommendation? I am a little concerned about the Section A of this proposed regulation. Um, my impression had been that we were going to ask for more of a um, definition 
of the requirement for collaboration having to do with risk factors. And that is not spelled out here. Um, th my understanding of the reasoning for that is that um, collaboration in cases of normalcy are not necessary. And that we were looking for more of a, a real definition of the differences, um, that collaboration was needed for risk factors, but not for normalcy. And again, the information and the language that was revised, it was taken from the interested parties meeting, it was brought back. And I understand that. Yeah. And I think that something got missed in that. That's, I, I'm wondering why it was written in this way when my impression was that we were asking for that. So let me ask for a clarification from what you're saying, because I, okay. The way it's written now, does it present additional barriers? Or stronger language, or what? It, uh, what I read in this says that we are um, that collaboration has been met if we have somebody who will provide guidance to us after the woman has been transferred. It doesn't say guidance; it says collaboration, uh, uh, providing guidance and instructions, instructions regarding the care of women and or newborns right, once they've been transferred right. after transfer of care. That, to me, goes without saying. After transfer okay, of care, right away, the, the, uh, pay, the, the woman or the newborn would be in the care of the physician. Granted, but, okay, so what this basically is doing, in a way, is setting up a situation by which you get the other without having to define the other. So the issue being, at that point, I think, is that the object being is that the less that is set in law... Yeah. Less is more. Less is more. <laughs> and I well, think we need to be careful... And just cognizant of the fact that um, if you're going to get what you what is necessary in order for you to do your job, doctors are going to have to get do what's necessary for their job. And, and plausible deniability is not the word I'm looking for, but you know what I'm saying. I do. I understand that. And I, I guess, Ms. Dobbs, I would like a, a legal opinion. Does this absence of specific definition of, of what I'm talking about in this section does that leave midwives of the, uh, able to function on their own for cases of normalcy? I, I think that as written here, um, it leaves out the specifics. And generally in, um, in regulations, you want to leave out the very minute details, I mean, that makes them much more cumbersome and much more difficult to get you where you need to go. Okay. So, so this, this really is the recommended approach. Okay. I'm also, Thank you. also in rereading this, I'm seeing that there's an or here. It says, for the purpose of providing guidance and instructions regarding the care of women and or newborns or consulting with a licensed midwife after the care of a patient's been transferred. So it looks like it covers both before transfer and after transfer to me. Mm -hmm. It's giving you a broader perspective, I think. Right. The, the doctor has a question. Yes. I'm sorry, I don't know how to um, stay in proper sequence. You actually raise a very good point I had not considered mm -hmm. because if the language doesn't define low risk versus high risk, it still leaves in place a requirement for an, a relationship. It's simply changing the name of that relationship from supervisor to collaborative. Mm -hmm. So this does not, the way it is right now, without defining high risk or low risk, it does not provide for truly independent practice. It's simply changing the title from a supervisor to a collaborator that needs to be in place for all care. Mm -hmm. And I don't see this changing anything that is currently within the scope of practice. Yeah. It's, again, the absence of the verbiage allows by virtue of the fact that it's not stated in black and white. If you're going to stay in black and white, you're going to limit even further what you are trying to achieve. Does it seem reasonable to say that if you have a collaborative relationship with a physician and between the two of you, you agree that if the mother is healthy and there isn't any issue, since we are skilled in the practice of midwifery and he is skilled in the practice of medicine, that it would be appropriate for us to, that that does represent a, 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 a negotiated conclusion between the midwife and the 
uh, right, and the physician. But what you're looking for is not is to to leave the assumptions ambiguous. You're, you're yes. looking, and that's what you're you're going down a path where you're not going that way. So I just want you to be, which is fine if that's where you want to go. I just want you to be very well aware of what you're. No, I. You assume to be correct is a, is correct, and if if I'm going to tell you what's correct, then there's no wiggle room. Okay. All, all, all I'm saying, I'm, I'm not actually arguing for any change over the way it says what it says right now. I'm, I'm only saying that, that if one collaborates with a physician, that would be part of what you would converse about, is that you would only want to see them if there was a problem. You wouldn't, I wouldn't be calling you to say, you know, Mrs. Jones is in labor. So what? You know, she's healthy. The baby's fine. I'm fine. You know, I just wanted to wake you up at 4 in the morning just to let you know. <laughs> I personally think that the language here is specific enough and non-specific enough. I mean, it's it's broad, and I don't think it's going to I don't think it's going to in any way change how midwives in California have been practicing for the last almost 15 years, 12 years since we became licensed. So 19 years. Well, but, it, but it also gives the the medical professional, the, the MD in the in this in the picture the object that that they've established a relationship there is a, a is the um, the collaboration opportunity without impacting their license with the not license their insurance so that's another issue why you want to try and keep this a little bit more um, non focused I think okay. has that been validated do we know that the insurance carriers actually would feel no, that? no we don't know that um, because from a risk management standpoint when I'm asked to help um, provide defense for both for physicians and midwives very often plaintiff attorneys will try and draw that relationship. Uh, then I apologize. I, I stand no, corrected. Just, um, where even if a midwife simply makes a phone call to a doc, they'll bring both into the suit regardless mm -hmm. of status. So I, I see the intention, but I'm not still convinced or comfortable that this is going to meet the intended goal. I don't think we'll know whether it will meet the intended goal until we put it into practice and see what happens. Absolutely, I agree. Yeah, there were there were it was nobody from the insurers industry at the interested parties meeting, so they didn't they didn't give us any input. So we're kind of have to wait and see what happens. I also want to point out that that is their those are the decisions of those parties, ACOG and the and Capley and whatnot, to define they could define it in other ways, and they've chosen to define it that if you have any professional relationship of any sort, we're going to call that supervision and then we're going to forbid you to do it. So I think that may actually wind up being a matter of some kind of other legal action. We're not going to be able to solve it with this regulation. I'm not sure if that's coming from ACOG because for certified nurse midwives, it's actually pretty clear what the term supervision means. So I think it's more maybe extrapolating from that statute and regulatory language, but also the reality of where plaintiff attorneys and others will go. I, I, I know, but you still, I mean, you still have to fight that one out in court. Yeah. You know. <laughs> but even, even before we get there, <laughs> I think you have to remember, too, that this is. Um, suggestion for regulatory language and that there's a whole process of public hearings that go along with that. So um, once noticed, if it ever gets there, um, hopefully interested parties will come forward and participate in the regulatory process and then there's further flushing out of whatever you don't think it's clear or whatever you think. Um, is not sufficient to get you where you want to go. So what you're suggesting then is to go forward with this as now as a recommendation and see what gets flushed out with the public hearings of the interested parties? Absolutely. I mean, I think you're going to have more flushing out one, once it gets to the full board as well. So there's plenty of, an op plenty of opportunity to um, fine-tune this. Is there any more comment from the council members? Seeing none, I'm going to I'm going to move to um, public comment. Um, Mr. Cooney.
good afternoon. My name is Frank Cooney, and I'm the director of California Citizens for Health Freedom, and our organization has followed this issue of physician supervision on about 15 years, Karen, and it has been a problem for the public, it has been a problem for midwives, it's been a problem for doctors, and it's been a big problem for the medical board on how to deal with this issue. And it needs to be dealt with and needs to be resolved. And I'm pleased that this committee, which was established by the medical board, will be able to refer it back to the medical board and ask them to sponsor a bill to take care of it. Because if they sponsor a bill, the chances of its passage is greatly increased. And, and it will help resolve problems that that has been existing a long time for all parties involved. And I do recommend very strongly that go to the medical board, strongly saying, sponsor a bill to resolve this problem, and they can iron out the differences of the minor language problems and get it on its way. I kind of want to congratulate the committee for c considering this request. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Yvonne Chong. Good afternoon, I'm Yvonne Chung with the California Medical Association. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment on these proposed um, regulations. Um, the issues I wanted to just bring up um, are similar to the ones that we've brought up uh, with, uh, with regard to these regs um, and at the interested stakeholders meeting and at other um, midwifery advisory um, council meetings as well. Uh, we have concerns also that um, these proposed regs fail to fully define the nature of what is going to, how you define establishing a collaborative relationship. I know that you've taken out the word informal, but um, I think there still remains some question. And from the point of view of our physicians, I think more detail actually is better because, um, you know, just from your discussion here, clearly a lot of explanation was needed to define when it's a low risk, when it's a high risk. Um, and for the purposes of um, building comfort uh, among the insurance carriers, I think that more definition would be better as well. Um, I think that gives them a sense of what it is, what, what the risk is that they're going to be insuring. So I think if that's the end goal is to um, facilitate uh, uh, liability carriers um, being able to comfortably write premiums for um, Physicians, um, I think that a lot more definition is needed, um, you know, clear definitions of when care has been transferred to the physician, um, possibly a statement of um, informed consent as well um, to the patient, so it's clear to the patient as well what the nature of that relationship is, so that there is very little question. I do understand that, you know, the need to, you know, leave it a little bit vague, but I think this is um, probably a little too far in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Laurie Gregg. I think you all know Shannon Smith Crowley. Also, she's our, our lobbyist. So, Welcome. I'm here representing ACOG. I'm the chair of District Nine, which is California. So, thank you, thank you for letting me comment on these. Um, just to echo some of the concern, the, the collaboration um, <coughs> and the, the way the regulation is worded is probably too vague. And um, I fear that it may make things worse rather than better because it, it really leaves it so undefined. Um, so we have been with you through the interested parties meeting. I know Dr. Haskins, who served on the MAC, um, gave, gave some written um, comments on this. And I think the spirit of those was tried to be incorporated within these regulations, but I think we can do better. We could certainly always do better at the interested, you know, going further and then have it brought back to the MAC, but my suggestion would be to make it better here at the MAC and then send it forward. So um, three issues that I'd like to see in it, if, if we could, um, is an improved informed consent. If we're really changing the law that was passed with physician supervision to remove that, then I think the client, the patient, um, deserves to know that. Um, it would be also helpful, I think, for that informed choice to know the training and education of the licensed midwife. Um, again, that there's no physician supervision, that they're not a nurse midwife or a physician, 
that there's a transfer plan and what that transfer plan is, the grievance process, and whether they carry liability insurance. And I'll give you guys a written um, summarization of what I say. Also, um, we see that this home birth process and transfer process in other states and as a district chair I can see what's been working well in other states and what's not been working well and certainly what we've seen is that this process is a lot safer for the consumer if it's limited to low risk births and so our second request especially given that physician supervision is being removed is that home births are limited to low risk pregnancies and we would have that we would recommend that be defined by the World Health Organization. Um, and then uh, to, to help you better define collaboration, one suggestion we had is midwifery-directed physician consultation, that the midwife engages the physician when she feels like she needs that, and then that consultation is done on a face-to-face -face basis, and then we continue on with California's standard of non-vicarious liability, where the physician isn't held responsible for things that happen at home, and outside of their presence, but once the, the client, the patient engages with them, and certainly once transfer occurs to the hospital, then, then uh, they come on board with that. What I'm trying to do with my fellows in California is, is to have them have a good relationship with the midwives that perform the home births, and I think because of fear of liability, that is not optimal, and I think that um, the way it's worded in these regulations, it, it doesn't make it any better, and it has potential to make it worse. Yeah, if I may add a, a few comments to what uh, Dr. Gregg said. Um, I think, as Dr. Burns said, there's two separate issues. There's ACOG issues and there's liability issues. And for ACOG standing, staying within the standard of care, it would be better to have it be the consultative relationship. Um, and then also for the professional liability insurance, that also would, would be the case. Um, and one thing that you might want to consider is there's actually some distinct differences that perhaps you want to have in the regulation because, as Dr. Gregg said, that we keep going back to the liability coverage is just is, is the root of this issue and we keep going in circles around this. Um, but there, there are some, some, some circumstances where there is liability coverage. The, I have not found anything that says that a physician can't supervise or have, you know, consult, collaborate, you know, back up, however you want to define it. Um, for a licensed midwife who provides um, care at a uh, licensed birth center, and I did not have a chance to look up what those statistics were. I know it's a small, much smaller group, but there are, but there are some. So in those circumstances, the other thing I think that, that we could explore is um, the feedback that we've had about the limitation on liability coverage has been from the, I'm not sure if you would call them commercially available plans, they're, they're privately held, but, but you know, a, a public, you know, a community doctor can, uh, can purchase them, such as the doctor's company or, or NorCal. But there are plenty of self-insured entities, such as counties and uh, University of California. And that doesn't mean that they would be wholly without having to do any kind of underwriting or a risk assessment. They, they might also say, we're going to allow physicians to supervise in the instance of a normal or low risk birth. You know, they might have some parameters like that. But, um, but that there may be some differentiation in, in some kind of, I guess, settings might be uh, the, the circumstance. Um, but uh, we actually, uh, I think, uh, echo Frank uh, Cooney's comments in terms of we need to go back and do some, some legislative fixes here, that there's only so much that we can do with the regulation because we're dealing with what the statute says. Um, and I've, I am a neophyte in this compared to some of the others of you, and I'm kind of tired of this. Um, and and <laughs> like to see <laughs> in, in, in dealing with this, this issue without resolution. Um, and I have not seen um, a solution as to how we, we deal with the liability uh, coverage. As Dr. Gray said, she's on our national committee and hasn't seen some good models. So there's going to need some, be some people, I think, to, that take a step back this fall and see how we can redefine the statute because just simply removing physician supervision isn't going to be the best thing for the woman and, and for the baby. I mean, the, from what I've read, the studies show that the best care if you're going to do a home birth is when the care is delivered within an integrated system and that we need to somehow foster that relationship and under the current statute and situation, that's not really possible. So 
Uh, I think as a, uh, a, an interim measure and a, and a minimum to, to get something going and putting on the books, uh, the suggestions that, that Dr. Gregg, I think, I, I hope that you take those into consideration and put those in place for now, and then we'll have to come back and do some legislation. May I just Please clarify question. something? Um, first of all, we are required to have a transfer plan in each woman's chart. Uh, we are required to disclose whether or not we carry malpractice insurance. Those are already in our laws. Um, there is an essential transfer of care plan always. Um, so uh, some of the things that um, Dr. Gregg has suggested do already exist. Um, if they need strengthening in some way or all changing in some way that could possibly be part of what both Ms. Smith Crowley and Mr. Cooney have mentioned. Um, we need legislative fix. We all know that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let me ask a clarification based on what you just suggested here. Would having that information within the specific language of the regulation take away what is missing or what people don't assume is there but really is there? I mean, are we... It would be redundant. I, I understand it's redundant, but if, if the issue is within the regulations that's holding people back from supporting the regulations, if it had more information that is already in law or in statute or in wherever it is anyway, it's not redundant in this paragraph. It may be redundant in another... Mm -hmm piece of paper. Or it, it is already book. in regulation. Yeah. It's so, but, the, but if we're having all these piecemeals of regulations, should we have one regulation that has everything in it so we would stop having this dilemma of this discussion every single time we discuss the same issue? I, I, I think what Barbara's saying is if we just as we've referenced in the, in the regulation that um, we've gone back to um, Regulation 1379.22 in terms of defining the physician's requirements, we could also reference other statute or um, I think it's in statute, isn't it, that requires that we give the informed consent. For it's in statute. It, it's, that, could, that could also be. It's also in the regulation that re relative to the standard of care. Right. Yes. So, it, I mean, the standard of care could be possibly referenced in here, I think, is what does that make sense that if, if in this <clears throat> regulation we put something like that, would that make it more upfront for people reading it from your side of the table um, to say, oh, yeah, okay, that's really there without having to drag through all the rest of the regulations to find it? Uh, it certainly couldn't hurt. And, you know, certainly defining that collabor collaborative relationship more is probably the most important thing. How would you see that defined? I see it, you know, the um, going by our national documents, um, we probably could have something more vague um, if it was with an established group that we're known to collaborate with. So like for instance, we have a collaborative statement with certified nurse midwives, and we know that their training is standardized, and we um, uh, very much doctors know what to expect. It's a known entity. Mm -hmm. So I think that the fact that um, uh, licensed midwives have some uh, variety in the way that they were trained um, leads us to be a little bit more cautious and not use the word collaboration. That I think here I'll give you a real life example of where it might be scary for a physician in that case. Um, someone's collaborating with you, do you then put my name on every chart and am I then um, attached to that patient despite the fact that I haven't been woken up at 4 a.m. to say that she's in labor? And so I think a, a midwife directed consultation where it's not a, we even try to not curbside with our own high risk perinatologist. It's not the best behavior you want. If we need help with a higher specialist, we may touch base if we need something immediately by phone, but then we're going to send the patient to them just to have a face-to-face -face so they can get a better impression of what's going on. So I would say a midwifery-directed consultative process where that that physician and that client patient see each other face-to-face, -face, and certainly on transfer that would be the case. Okay. If that does not make it too burdensome, I think that combined with the World Health Organization criteria actually would be pretty helpful. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, among the stakeholders, we, we have midwives who want to be able to practice safely, clinically, but also safely in regard to current regs. And they're having a hard time finding physician supervisors. We have physicians often not willing to be supervisors because they don't want to be pulled into either clinical problems where they could have um, 
avoided with earlier contact or maybe as an unavoidable clinical outcome, but they don't want to be pulled into the litigation side. Mm -hmm. So in a way, even if this were to go through like this, that would help the midwife stakeholders. I do not think it has enough clarity to allow a community doc to say, oh, with this, sure, I'm glad to take your call. I, I think that you would have a one-sided relationship where midwives are now happy with this change, but it wouldn't change the, the paradigm for the docs. Mm -hmm. and I think we have to look for solutions that changes that paradigm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and unfortunately, the liability carriers wouldn't sign on on this most likely, and they, um, ACOG doesn't help them define what they cover. They just they they are they're the boss. Right, I understand that, Dr. Greg. Um, when you say midwifery directed consultation, are you? Are envisioning this as um, something that all midwives would do with every woman in no. their care, or just no. risk factor times? Just, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. I um, know there are some states that require that. There's a few states that require every um, home birth client to have a mandated consult, and we discussed that at the California level. And um, the doctors but, don't want to do it. No, I think that <laughs> you know. I think that if you can give, you know, our if a woman chooses home birth, our our hope is that it's done with a good education and informed consent, and that we're, we're there for when you need us. That is what we would all like. Um, as far as informed consent goes, that, I, that is something else that is included in our, what are currently our laws and um, regulations. Mm -hmm. um, I, this might or might not be the time to bring this up. Um, I, and I understand the whole low risk, high risk issue. Mm -hmm. But when I first started midwifery, we had moderate risk. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the line, that dropped away from anybody's consciousness or thought process. And I think that that is not in the best interest of mothers and babies. Mm -hmm. um, it isn't just low risk and high risk. There is a, there's an incredible large middle zone. Um, one of the things that happened in terms of some of the regulations that we do have um, in trying to come up with some kind of compromise, especially for those women who are in this middle zone, um, was that they have a right to determine their own care. They have a right to determine how they want to be treated and dealt with. Um, what we don't want to do is to push women into unassisted home birth. We think that they have a right to have competent and vigilant care in the setting of their choice because we, it's also clear that those women will do much better if they have somebody there watching over them. So. That, I think, needs to be brought into the conversation, and I think we need to reinstate moderate risk. Yeah. I think our organization um, continues to have trouble with the t multiple breaches and VBACs. I understand that, and these are women who will choose those, and many of them will choose that even if we are disallowed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can what I happens to those women? Why do they not deserve to have licensed care? May I ask a question in, say, the Netherlands? Those women, um, are they allowed to home birth? In the Netherlands? Um, I actually don't know at this time. That certainly has been true in the past. Um, I would have to look into that for right now. It is perhaps Diane Holzer, who is uh, with us today, might know that better. She is more uh, versed in the international um, ways of midwifery. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are many states in the U.S. where it is allowed. Vermont allows VBAC breaches of twins. Mm -hmm. New Hampshire okay. allows these things. So, there so are does other California. California <laughs> allows And California them. does by regulation. I think we need but to. But with full informed consent. We're talking, again, informed consent is the centerpiece for midwifery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, so, uh, yeah. And that was passed with a law that said physician supervision. Can well, it was it's actually it the was our standard of care was, was passed well after we knew we ha didn't have physicians. That is correct. That was 2006. So, yeah, yeah. So uh, I mean, it was it was, it was still all in parties law, but by not, then. not occurring. Right. It. Well, it's still going to be in law. This regulation can't change the law. Right. It's just defining supervision in a different way than we're used to supervision being defined. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's important to note here that California is the only or only one of two states in the entire United States that requires physician supervision Correct. Mm -hmm. for any variety of midwife. So um, we're kind of the outliers there. Um, if there's not any more real salient comments here, Dave? I, I have Two questions now. <laughs> Was uh, one a minute ago? Um, I want clarification. I understood you to say that since we're taking supervision out of the law, I don't 
see yeah. that 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 the um, this regulation, which is defining supervision, would would be able itself to take supervision out of the law. We're defining supervision, not taking it out. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would be my take on it. Is that not yours? No, I think we're we're playing with words here, right? I mean, my my ideal goal would be to change the law for, because what we're talking about truly isn't supervision, correct? Um, so to to portray it as that, I think is a um, well, not ideal. Yeah. I, I will tell you, as someone who was at the very first Midwifery uh, Implementation Committee, there was a document produced by the Medical Board that defined all the possibilities for supervision. One of which was that the midwife. Uh, calls a doctor when there's a problem to you know to to consult about. So, I, I don't see that that this um, uh, this vicarious liability creation is the bottom line definition of supervision. Mm -hmm. Although I know that the, certainly the malpractice carriers do. Mm -hmm. um, the other question that I had was, since we're since 48 of the 50 states, ACOG is an is a uh, an American, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, 50 states. What do they do in those other 50 states where supervision is not required? What is the language used on those circumstances? I could get you examples of that. Um, you know, some of them, as I mentioned, have a mandated consultation for every client who chooses home birth. Some people... Well, but most of them don't. Most people... Uh, yeah, that's probably a minority of them. But it, it really varies, and it's state-dependent. And um, we have collected all that language, and I don't have it with me right now, but I could... I could give you examples of all those other states. And what they do. I, I always am conf confused or conflicted or something that, that ACOG so much wants us to have supervision in, in California, but it's okay for Nevada and Montana and Florida and all those other states to not, you know, for midwives to not have physician yeah. supervision. And I don't know how much, you know, that supervision clause was what, 19 years ago, so... Um, 20, you know, when it went through the know, legislation. Things, ha things have evolved, and, um, you know, the, I think there were other players in, in the game when physician supervision was placed in the law. I think it's it's challenging to compare states as well, because it, isn't there a variety where some states don't allow licensed midwives? We're, we're talking about where there's licensing, okay, and so, certainly... So it's we're, not necessarily two out of 50, it's two, two out, out of... Two out of 26. Okay. Well, but, but also for nurse midwives. Nurse midwives are not required in other states. states, so you okay, know. Okay, so we we really need to move forward here. Um, are you finished? I'm finished. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I would love to see what you've collected, by the way, on the on the other states. It'd be fantastic. Can I just Thank make you. One comment. Um, sure. I guess I'm a little concerned if the liability issue is one of the biggest issues for removing barriers to practice that we don't have any feedback from the liability. Or yeah. I'll, I mean, they'll, I'm not they'll, sh I they'll show up when this gets set for hearing. Okay. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> they will definitely show up. <laughs> and I'm sure they were invited today. They, 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 they've been invited all okay. along. And they were Just invited for the interested the parties forward. meeting. And they did not come. They didn't come. No. no yeah. They're waiting to see, see it move forward. Thank you. So I have one more person I'd like to speak on this. Diane Holzer. Hi. Diane Holzer, midwife at large. Um, I really, I like the way it's written right now. It's not perfect, and I don't think we're ever going to get perfectness in, with this situation that we've got until we go to the legislature. But what it does is it actually reflects what's happening. Because there are physicians out there who will collaborate with the licensed midwives. And so what this does is just state, that it just makes those of us who have those collaborative relationships legal. I mean, that, it, it is happening. There are physicians all across the state who will collaborate with us but who are not able to supervise us. So that's the main reason that I like the wording uh, as it is now. I, the suggestions that Dr. Gregg mentioned with ACOG, I don't mind any of those. I think that having um, a further definition of a collaboration, though, I don't think that's going to work at all. And what I, what did, what, I, what I really wanted to ask was OSHPED, out of, um, it, you know, in our stats, our overall stats, how many of the midwives actually have collaboration? Do you remember that? I don't remember from looking at that. What was the question again, Diane? How many of the midwives actually have collaboration? Not, fi not supervision, but collaboration. Isn't it the majority of it's them? It's in the statistics. It's in the, uh, what I, I pulled this out, um, 
percentage of women served while the licensed midwife had supervision in 2011. This is 2012. In 2011, 6.5%. Had supervision, but That's how about collaboration? Percentage of women served who received collaborative care, 58.2%. Hmm. That's still not great, but it's more than half of the women. So it does show that collaboration it's works happening. at some level. It, it is, is happening. happening. Yeah. So I think everything oh, no, no. that yeah. ACOG said would be fine, except for defining that collaboration. I think that would backfire on us. What I would be interested in, I don't know if ACOG has done this, but I would be interested in what the physicians who actually collaborate with the midwives think. Do they want more of a defined relationship or are they more happy just collaborating with the midwives as it comes by? I don't know if ACOG has done that, but that would be a very interesting thing to know is if the physicians who do collaborate, do they want it more defined or would that make it worse? in the long run for us. Otherwise, I think what, what ACOG is wanting would be fine, other than that specific definition. But overall, I just want to speak in support of the wording as it is now. Thank you. Do you have a, a question, Dr. Burns? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm still learning the parliamentary procedures. Um, so am I. So this is not the place to be educated. <laughs> 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 oh, man, don't punch my ticket for that. Um, <laughs> That's not the job here. I mean, it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, I'm, uh, I, a lot of my work is done at improving health care systems, you know, individual care for individual women, but also how do you put teams in place and processes and procedure in place. And so I, um, I will learn over time how the data is even collected. It, to me, if it's a self-reported, quote, collaboration that hit nearly 60 percent, that's great. But did the person who was identified as the collaborator know they were the collaborator? Not necessarily. Not so, necessarily. So this is where, again, I come from a, um, a background, much like aviation safety for commercial aviation, where if someone knows they are the collaborator, it's because they have it documented that they are the collaborator. So I will learn, and I appreciate your guys' patience. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a couple more people that would like to speak. Uh, Jocelyn Grote. Hi there, I'm Jocelyn. I'm a um, licensed midwife in Santa Cruz County, and I just have a question just from the um, kind of perspective of the daily practice and what that looks like. Um, obviously, most of the midwives in California are practicing where their collaboration takes place in the context of the doctor who's on call for the house at the time of need being the consulting MD. Like Diane said, many midwives also have informal re relationships that they can count up on in non-emergent consult. So my question is, is, you know, this kind of speaks to that being able to call up a doctor in their office that a midwife has a relationship with in order to get a face-to-face -face consult for their mom that doesn't necessarily t to take place in the labor and de delivery room. So my question is, is what if a midwife cannot find this collaboration? What if in her community there's actually not a doctor that's able to do that because most of the doctors, I mean, there are many friendly doctors that are out there, but maybe there's one and they don't want to informally or per this regulation provide that consultation for the 20 midwives in their city. We're, we're hoping that this will make it more fluid. Mm -hmm. Until it's in practice, we don't know if that will be the case. Mm -hmm. My personal thought is we have to go this route, see if it works, and if it doesn't work, then I think the next step is to get amended legislation. Per this, okay. Then my second question is um, per the point of um, Dr. Brian Burn. Burn. Um, so we, it sounds like we will, there'll be further def definition to define who our consulting doctor is, and then via the charting process, clearly chart that this is who we're consulting um, whatever topic through. Correct. That's, that, that's how I would do it. Right. But I'm not sure that every midwife would do it that way. I, I'm, it's, not, it's not in the regulation how you would have to do it. Okay. And it's purposely not. Okay. So it's just a matter of that doctor's own discretion, how much they fully understand they are the consulting MD and how much they are being tracked through those notes. And then what is still unknown is the vicarious liability involved in that process. Yeah. I would think it was, would be in how you set it up with that particular physician. And it may be different physician to physician, how, how they want to, to negotiate that with you. 
Okay. So. And so is there any value of having a stipulation here of what a midwife is supposed to do if she cannot find a collaborating doctor? Which I, I feel like we're lucky in Santa Cruz that we have that, but I can imagine throughout the state there's there, that There potential. are places where there are no collaborators, and just like we haven't been able to get physician supervision, it's something Currently. that now has to be tried. We'll see, does it work? Are midwives pretty easily able to get collaborative relationships, mm -hmm. or are they not? Have we, in fact, with the regulation, made it harder to have that collaborative relationship, like is being suggested by um, Dr. Gregg? Mm -hmm. Or have we made it easier, and until we do it, we won't know. There's only one way to know. And know. I just wanted to um, add for doc Dr. Gregg, you know, in most um, community midwives, we absolutely talk about su supervision, transfer of care, training, don't have malpractice, grievance per per procedure. That's a standard part, just so you guys know, of what every midwife talks about in her informed con con consent. So uh, many of what was suggested is kind of already taking place. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Tosi Marceline. Hi, I'm Tosi Marceline, midwife in this area. And just addressing what you said, Dr. Byrne, about how many of those uh, collaborative relationships that we put on our forms are actual people who know who we are. Um, the majority of ours in our practice, and we see about 60, 65 women a year, um, it's Kaiser. They don't care, they don't know. And when it's not, it's someone, because that's what the statistics tell us, form tell us to do, if she saw a physician and then transferred into us, and the physician says that she uh, doesn't want to see this woman anymore because she's having a home birth, that's counted in the statistics as a super, she had some supervision during her pregnancy. Um, so I don't think that the, um, statistics we fill out every year makes a very good case for how much collaboration is actually going on. In our practice, which stretches from Fair Oaks to Fairfield and Rumsey, if anybody knows where that is, to Carmichael um, and Elk Grove, it would be really difficult. Would we have to do this for, you know, as a supervisor for us as midwives or individually for our uh, particular clients since they live in geographical areas that are, I mean, we did births in five different counties last year, maybe more, I can't remember, but I'm hoping to narrow it down. Um, and so it, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. I understand the philosophical reasons behind doing this. I just hope we know what we're getting into. Right. And as we all said to each other when the law was passed in 93, they're already licensing people who thought that we were outlaws. So one more regulation isn't going to make us stop doing what we're doing. But yeah, uh, I, I, let's see what happens. I think it's important to note that the regulation doesn't, is, doesn't say that you must have col a collaborative relationship for each woman. It's, it's vague enough that, that yeah. you could only institute that with need. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gregg, did you have something to add? I just wanted to see if I could answer some of the questions that was posed that were posed to the physician community. And, um, you know, what I have... Um, uh, friends that collaborate with midwives, and certainly I would be more willing to collaborate if uh, it was better defined. Because when you speak with them, and what they tell us is that they do this underground, and they do it at their own peril. And wouldn't it be nice for us to work better together, to not have to put them in that peril, um, and have more physicians step up to the plate to be available? So if you leave it like this, it's that's uh, unlikely to happen. Um, so that would be the reason for better defining the relationship. And, and again, what is the definition? I mean, what I've said is that the, the specific issues you brought up are already covered in our laws Great. and regs. Great, and I, we, I, I applaud you for that. And so um, the informed consent, if everybody's already doing that, 
hooray. Um, you know, the, the limitation to low risk, you know, who's, what's low, what's moderate, what's high, again, we'll, we'll continue to have a problem with high risks done at home. <laughs> um, and, and, and then so it just comes down to better defining that relationship and better defining it for the, the patient's, the woman's sake. When I, the we, we, I think it would be wonderful if you could actually give us some language that you think would help with that definition. I, I, would, I would replace collaboration with uh, midwife-directed consultation. How does that, I, I'm not clear how that changes it. Um, that, that, it's, um, it's sort of, beha you know, uh, um, allowing the physician to really define that. We're covered as physicians right now under our liability carrier if we have a patient come see us face-to-face -face in our office and we, we give our opinion and do our exam, that's all covered, as is when the woman makes it to the hospital and she sees us face-to-face. -face. What we're not covered for is getting on the phone with you and saying, oh, I'd do this. Um, that's not covered. And if anything happened in that pregnancy, um, we would go bare with the liability coverage and if, if the woman decides to bring suit, and then um, I would assume she would bring suit against the physician because that's generally the person that's covered. So basically, what you're saying is you need a you need the same kind of relationship as I would have. I, I work in a um, private physician office in Sacramento, and for instance, if I if I have somebody who's higher risk than our office generally deals with, I get a perinatologist consult. Mm -hmm. That is that what you're. That's it's, what, it's right, a similar right. kind of thing. And we wouldn't just say, "Well, I'm just going to put Dr. Gilbert's name down on this patient chart because I have a good relationship <laughs> with him," right? Yeah, we, wouldn't and we be wouldn't be too even, happy about that. And we wouldn't even document his name if we had a phone consult with him because really we haven't given him the opportunity to see the patient and assess the patient fully. Yeah, no, I only document their name if if he's actually already seen the yeah, patient. I'm yeah. just getting clarification. Right, from right. So I have asked a physician or two, may I chart that you've spoken with me right, about right, this, and right. they said yes. Yep, yep, because they, then they can give yeah. their permission. Right? Yeah. Right. So, so what you're really looking for is that you you think physicians would get more on board if we changed the collaborative relate if we define the collaborative relationship as a midwife directed MD consultation where the midwife said look I need you to go see Dr. X and get their opinion on this right. and then Dr. X can say okay I think blah 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 and they can send us something in writing that about what they think and then the woman can either act on that or not act on that and the midwife can either act on it or not act right. on it right. but it takes the, the liability out of the physician's pocket. Right and we, we often the, the people that work with midwives at this point they'll document in their chart whether that uh, relationship is then ongoing with that patient or where, whether it's ended with that consultation and most because it's just a consultation they go back to your care it'll end there and then you restart it again okay. could, can I uh, give a word for this which is that we're trying to keep it from from creating retroactive liability that with with consultation or I'm I'm sorry what we're reading no, con 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 collaboration that we're, the way it's written right now then anyone you collaborated with would be uh, it's, uh, retroactively liable for things that he or she wasn't even knowledgeable of perhaps right. which is obviously not uh, not a good idea for anybody mm -hmm. I had hoped that we were going to have some language in here specifically stating that there was no physician liability until transfer of care mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, yeah I'm please um, Kurt Hepler, um, staff council. I, I think for the new members and perhaps for um, bit of a refresher for some of the more veteran members. I'm going to be take just about 30 seconds and sort of um, give you the role according to Kurt. We, <laughs> when we, the medical board and therefore all its committees and task forces exercises its uh, regulatory licensing or disciplinary functions, it does so with the consumer protection being our paramount mm -hmm. obligation. Mm -hmm. The second thing that's important is when the medical board, and I'll use all licensees, when the medical board does something like disciplines a licensee, not necessarily a midwife, or denies a license, it doesn't do so to get even with the applicant or the licensee. It's well settled in the case law that the purpose of an administrative disciplinary proceeding or a licensing proceeding Perfect. is... Yeah, here that was my intent. Your, your mic's <laughs> not on. <laughs> is that better? Yes. Yeah, okay. So now I have to repeat everything I said. No, I'm just kidding. So the, the purpose of administrative proceeding, disciplinary license, in essence, is to protect the public. 
The purpose of a civil litigation, okay, is a little bit different. And candidly, as I've told my enforcement people who are unlucky enough to subject themselves to my enforcement academy classes, is we don't deal in civil litigation. That's not our job. We don't award money damages. We don't determine uh, the relief to a party. We do things like shape a license, uh, constrict a license, condition a license to get to use a legal vernacular. And we do that for one overarching purpose, and that's public protection. I would posit to you, as I'm not a lead attorney on this, but I would posit to you that what we do, and as we discuss things about civil litigation and the avoidance of civil litigation, that is truly speculative, speculative from this uh, little agency's perspective, because that's not our arena. The civil arena is something we don't we don't venture into, and so I would ask the, this uh, council to be clear in that when we say we try to essentially shield or promote or legal exposure or legal liability, that's really not our role. We deal in administrative discipline and a corollary is we deal in, in public protection. So with that, I'll be quiet. Okay, I, just, I have one, one more question for you, Dr. Craig. If the language was left the way that it is, it could then be up to the midwife and any particular doctor to define what that collaboration was going to look like between them. And your organization and, and the insurers could then say, if you do it this way, that's great. If you do it this way, that's not okay. You're not going to be covered. And without us having to change anything that's written here, how does, how does that sit? Um, I always think standardized procedures are better. Um, having it all variable, would it um, make more physician, physicians more willing? Uh, I, I think you would have a harder task getting physicians involved because it would be up to that midwife to engage that physician and to define that relationship. So what I'm proposing is something that may make physicians more available to you. And I think, you know, although it sounds like we're having a discussion about how to protect physicians from liability really that comes down to having physicians willing to engage in this process. Yeah, and so that makes it is, safer. that's why it's a consumer protection thing. And yeah. I just want, you know, ACOG, we want to make this a better process. You, we all know it can be better. We all know that it's not perfect. And I just don't think that these regulations do that. It, it's a good try, but we can do better. Thanks, Shannon. Unfortunately, I know more about insurance coverage than I ever thought I wanted to. And knowing what I know about the insurance coverage, there, there will be a presumption of collaboration, and the carriers will try to prove um, that, that it's um, a collaborative relationship so they don't have to, uh, to defend the suit. In most of these instances, that it, because the physician is only going to be seeing the patient for a limited period of time, they probably will, what they call, defense the case. There probably won't be, and, and that's the instance in most uh, cases, but what's costly to the physicians is really is the cost of defense. can easily be $100,000, $200,000. So that if you put the language out that it's going to be this limited situation, that will help set up the scenario for dealing with the carriers that this is truly the physicians responsible for this within this box. This block of care. And, and that is the midwife directed uh, consultation. That's what you're at Correct. Correct. pointing mm -hmm. to. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Does, I, I'm wondering if, if legal has any, anything to input on that in terms of changing the, the current language from collaborative relationship to a midwife directed consultation. Well, read, you read have the whole, wait, excuse me. So if you're going to read the sentence, read the whole sentence because what it what you have now is licensed midwife has established a collaborative relationship versus a midwife directed consultation. Right, I'm just I'm just really looking for what legal thinks in terms of broadly broadly changing it. Yeah, we'd have to wordsmith it quite a bit more, but um, well the, well, the first thing here is you have a motion on the floor. Right. So. I'm just, I'm not asking to change the language yet. I'm just asking for your comment on feasibility, if we wanted to go and, if we wanted to consider that. 
So if you wanted to consider that, what would have to happen is you would have to send this back to staff to continue working on it. Okay. That's what would have to happen. Okay. All right. Uh, I, I have a similar question for legal as well. Uh, ha having to do with if we actually go to hearing, could we do it in hearing? Could we send this forward and then let that change be done as a part of the hearing process? Right. So, M Madam, uh, sorry, Faith, um, just so we understand each other, we've got, assuming that this left, um, the, the Midwifery Advisory Council made a recommendation to bring this to the board and set it for a hearing. There's two stops along the way. The first one is, of course, the board itself, where the board will take deliberate on the matter and determine whether to accept the, the max recommendation to set it for hearing, assuming that it's in fact set for hearing. And then, of course, we have the 45-day comment period uh, where the board will accept written comments. And then we have the actual regulatory hearing at a board meeting where the board will again accept both oral and written comments and must, as it, if it decides at that point to proceed in the face of whatever those comments are, will have to answer every comment with an I or an A or we didn't think that was a good idea or whatever. So there's at least two stops along the way. There may be more if, in fact, in the face of those written or oral comments, um, uh, revisions are made, then we're back out for, depending on the nature of those, back out for 45 or 15 days. So we have a, there's quite a bit of logistical work uh, to... Uh, get from here to there, if you will. So, so, in other words, there are places where it can be changed besides here today? Correct. Okay. Thank you. And by changing it along the way, if it were deemed appropriate to change it along the way, would it then be implemented sooner than 19 years? <laughs> well, this would be a government project, so... <laughs> I, I would hope so, madam. <laughs> Okay, great. Back to your 19 years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dr. Shannon, do you, have, do you have more to add? Thank you very much. I have one more person that would like to comment on this. Constance Rock. I'll explain that later. Constance Rock, California Association of Midwives. Um, I was thinking it might be a good idea to ask the midwives who have collaborative relationships to speak to the physician and show them the two different languages, the way it's written now, the way that ACOG's proposing, and actually ask them what makes them most comfortable, and to actually survey them and find out. Okay, I'm going to task that to Cam to make that happen then. Right, no, that's what I'm saying. Cam can as, do that. As we move this forward then, yeah. we could ha that could be part of the, the commenting, commenting period. Okay. Thank you. Is there any more comment for, on this? from the council. Seeing then we take a vote on the motion. Well, I think, uh, sorry to interrupt again, I'm just probably too much. I would, I would think that the, that the council may want to take stock of the motion was, as I understand it, to go ahead and recommend that it be set in this form uh, for hearing. So we've had a whole bunch of comments about changing the definition. So I was just curious if you want to go ahead, because to me there's three options, for, essentially. We have a motion on the, on the floor, I know, but there's three options. One, forge ahead with it, is, with it and then with the con, kind of, kind of com, common understanding that it may be revised, revised upstream. Two is to say, no, we'll send it back. Or three is to try to amend it on the fly. Wait, wait, you're saying that we could amend it now? On right. You could essentially, if you had some amendments, you could ask the maker of the motion and the second if they would like to, you know, edit it on the fly, if we will. The problem is that becomes a bit of a logistical, <laughs> a little bit of logistical concern. Yeah. So. Well, my question, the reason I was surprised about that is the idea of wordsmithing this now without putting it out to bid, so to say, <laughs> to the experts right. who are going to be involved in this, the medical community, the collaborative practice opportunities that are there anyway. That's, concern, yeah, that's one of the that's one of the pitfalls of amending it on the fly. <laughs> um, my my personal preference would be to to rec go ahead with the motion, approve the motion the way that it sits now, in the language that that is currently here, and um, with the with the common understanding that it may get amended upstream. And I think we all kind of assume that that's going to happen anyway. See, I, I made the motion, right? So I, so I, they might, okay. 
my concern is is that the way the change in the language is not as big a change as we think it might be. So that um, the wordsmithing, I would rather see wait, only because I'd like to have additional input if we're going to get it along the way. I agree. But my concern is that I don't know how this could have been avoided to have had this happen in, in, in advance if this could have been sent out. No. But I'm not, I'm not convinced linguistically that there's a big difference other than it's a lot tighter the way we heard it from ACOC. It's a lot tighter. But in order to move the process forward, I don't know that I'm willing to pull the motion. Okay. Um, I, I think we, we lose a little bit of control by moving it forward in terms of how the, how the wording is going to be, whereas if we send it back to staff now um, to re-wordsmith it, um, we still don't know how it's going to come back in December because we're not part of the wordsmithing process. Um, I don't, I personally don't, I don't see a lot of value in changing the wording. I think that it, it, I, I, I hear what you're saying, Dr. Gregg, and I, I, I think that ultimately changing to a midwife directed consultation is probably not going to change a lot in the long run. However, it, with further discussion and uh, updating my myself on what that that entirely looks like, um, I might come to that agreement. I would just as soon not see this sit on our plate any longer. I'd like to move it forward to the board and begin to get it hashed out in, at the October meeting with the full board and see then where it sits. Does it go back to staff for rewordsmithing and then will it you know, where, where are we at with it after that? So what? let me just remind you about the realities of the medical board. <laughs> <laughs> that it'd be best behoove you to get everything in place beforehand. Yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, it's going to open it up and you're not, you're going to be waiting that 19 years. Yeah. I'm, I'm, so I'm real concerned. I, 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 I want to know, is there maybe legal or, or our executive director or someone could explain, is there any opportunity between now and October to make this tighten it up if it's if that's what it is to to we had the interested parties meeting i i don't know what the comments were from that i don't know how much of that is in here i'm assuming all of it right but i'm still hearing from acog i'm still hearing from members that are sitting here not a hundred percent agreement and my feeling is that um are the representative that we have of the um, docs that we want to be able to collaborate with has brought specific information here that she really believes that we need to have something better in order for the doctors to feel like they can work with us. And I think we need to honor and respect that and move ahead with her suggestions. So in order for us to consider new language, we have to pull the old motion, am I correct? Yes. So I'll pull the motion. The second has to agree. So who is the second? I think I seconded. Yes. So do you agree? I agree. Okay. Okay. So now you have no motion on the floor, and you can't really have a discussion. So now you need a new motion. Hmm. There you okay. go, Doctor, with your Robert's rules on that. Thank you. I so now move, you need a new motion. Okay. I move that we send this um, back to staff so that the suggestions of Dr. Greg can be incorporated. Um. I'm going to suggest that you're not going to you're not going to get by October. You're not going to get anything then. No, I realize like, it has to come back to us before it can move forward. Right. I I was hoping maybe we could talk more about. I I'd like to hear a motion that would allow us to discuss the language that Dr. Greg proposed. Okay, I'll make that motion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or you I'll want to make that it. motion? Okay. Okay. So. Um, my understanding: the only change that that was recommended was changing um, the sentence to include the terms midwife-directed consultation or collaborative. Is that correct, Dr. Gregg? Yes. Okay, so to remove the, uh, met the licensed midwife has, to remove has established a collaborative relationship with midwife-directed consultation means something different? 
<laughs> it does. I'm just asking the question. So the answer is yes. So that's the, so to change. Um, they're not. What if you put? What if you put after relationship? If you put through a midwife directed patient consultation. By not through. To, you take out collaborative before relationship and then put in something afterwards. Um, put it in afterwards. Has met if the, the licensed midwife, midwife has. A directed consultation with one or more physicians, correct? Mm. But that sounds like we're talking about in every case. Uh -uh. Faith, well, uh, if I could, from a legal perspective, you're exactly yes, right. Thank you. The connotation and denotation would say this was an individual relation, individualized relationship. This thing testing one um, with each patient or each client because you have a consultation basis indicating in my mind it's a one-to-one -one relationship. I'm consulting with the physician on behalf of this or in regard to this one patient. Relationship seems to be the top of the funnel, very wide, indicating it could be the overarching relationship. Get down to the consultation level, it seems to me it's an individualized manner. So you would read okay. that then as each, patient, each client in the midwife's care would need a consult? Correct. Okay. No, we, yeah, no, no, we don't want that. No. Want that we definitely don't want that. Here, a lot more broad. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, I can tell you what, what we'd like to see, and you can put it in legal wording. Uh, okay. we, as we spoke about, we'd like you, the midwives to direct a consultation when they feel it's necessary, and for that consultation to be face-to-face -face with the physician and the patient. And in each case, you know, in each case... So for each individual, so not a mandated consultation for each when individual. They feel it's necessary. When they feel it's necessary, and that consultation be uh, Wait, face to face. I'm. I would say medical indication rather than necessity, um, because necessity sounds like high risk mm -hmm. to me. No, it says it's when they. It, but the the pronoun doesn't go back to the medical. No, no, no. Doctor. I know. Okay, it goes back to what the I'm. Sentence. What I'm looking at is um, the. Uh, Requirement has, is deemed to have been met if the licensed midwife establishes midwife-directed physician consultation when there is medical indication. When they feel. When the midwife feels there is medical indication. But the they doesn't, you, you, the, day, the they is obscure enough that it's really not. So Who's they? The midwife. I haven't got a they in what I just read. Oh, I have a midwife, a they, <laughs> what I, from, doc, from what, she, what Dr. Craig said. So I think from the legal perspective as we try to draw that, I think the questions that have to be answered is, so it would be up to the discretion of the mid midwife, given whatever medical indications or conditions, to initiate the consultation? Correct. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. So midwife directed consultation when they feel it's necessary and cons and How about she? Based when the midwife. The when midwife. When the midwife. When the midwife? Uh -huh. Not they. It's, yeah, it, it's when the midwife. When the midwife. Okay. Or the LM. Yeah. Uh, then uh, LM, okay. Because I get confused when it's they. When the licensed midwife deems it's necessary? When the, when the <coughs> LM feels it's necessary to cons and the cons and the consult must be face to face. Between the patient. It could just say midwife directed face to face physician consultation. Physician patient consultation, yeah. Well, then you're yes. setting physician up a face to face patient. before you find out if you, you have a consult relationship. Say that again? She, she said I call you order. up and I say, I want you to consult with someone. Yes. That I've called you up and said, but if I have to come to you and say, I want you to consult with. It's the, it's the patient and, and the, the doctor physician. face to face. Right. The midwife. Okay, but I just want to make sure because the sentence sounds like it's at the same time. Uh, Can you read this? I, I need to hear the sentence. Yeah. What, th 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 okay. The requirement for physician supervision contained in Section 2507 of the Code is deemed to have been met if the licensed midwife establishes midwife-directed physician-patient consultation when the LM determines there is medical indication. It, it is not perfect sentence, but I'm just doing it by the seat of my pants right here. <laughs> if I may ask, did, yeah. I, I was trying to follow that, but in terms of when you were talking about the consultation, did you specify between... Physician patient. Okay, thank you. I wasn't sure. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. Can you thank read you. that one yeah, more time, please? Read sure. Read it slowly. So the, it, it, the first part is as written up through 
the second line if the licensed midwife okay, then go from there. establishes midwife hyphen directed mm -hmm. physician hyphen patient consultation when the LM or midwife determines medical indication. We need to add face um, to face. Do you think physician hyphen patient? It, we could also then put after physician hyphen patient put face to face consultation. Oh, I'm only doing it based on what they've said. Uh -huh. Could you simply say in person rather than face to face? Is that a little less? It, as background, um, just in the you know the, the, the different languages of different mm -hmm. countries and universes, a consultation and medical regulatory aspects is actually a face-to-face -face encounter. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily have to say that, but realize that that will be the way physicians and the physician side of regulatory will assume, uh, assume, assume it. Right. They will assume. Okay. So so consultation is face to face. It is something that happens well, in person. If it's a physician patient consultation, mm -hmm. I think physician set patient. That up okay. okay. Versus a professional colleague consultation. Okay. Which I think we all want to. Okay. Which we're not talking about. Distinguish. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that, Thank that, you. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah, could you read it for me one more time, please? The requirement for physician supervision contained in Section 2507 of the Code is deemed to have been met if the licensed midwife establishes midwife hyphen directed physician hyphen patient consultation when the midwife determines medical indication then we would have to then word craft to uh, for the next section um, could you just say for midwife uh, for Medical indications with, with or medical indications or medical sure. indications take sure. a few words out. Sure. So, physician patient consultation when the when the LM determines medical there's, there is medical indication. indication. Of what Faith is suggesting is just saying physician patient patient consultation for for medical, medical indications. indications. It's more streamlined. It's more streamlined. Yeah. Okay. Um, then we would have to read word some of it in order to go into the next section about meeting the requirements of section 1379.22, which I haven't. So then you're going to pick up then with one or more physicians? I don't really think that's necessary if we're talking about physician patient consultation. Okay. We don't you need have to, to define, define that. that. That the physician meets the requirements of Section 1379.22. Right. You could just leave it the same too after one more physician's comma for the purpose of establishing a midwife directed consultation. Okay. You can see it as it's worded, comma, and just insert for the purpose of establishing a midwife-directed consultation process. The, uh, the sentence goes easier, but I think it changes some of the meaning. Yeah, the the, mm -hmm. the sentence may flow easier, but um, again, it, the uh, the patient physician relationship is established with the face to face contact. If it's a consultation, if it's a supervisory role or a hospital care system, um, then in that language. You, simply by virtue of sending a patient or wanting to send a patient, even if they never show, it puts responsibility on the physician to track them down. Right. So, so I would say... It's more complex than it wording. I would say um, there should be a period after medical indications, another sentence, the physician must meet the requirements of Section 1379.22. I like that. And then just leave out the rest of it. What, what was B trying to accomplish in these... B is trying to accomplish some kind of um, elimination or lessening of vicarious liability. It doesn't, yeah, it's a little... I vague. know, which is why, why I'm saying I had hoped there would be more specific language yeah. saying. And I can give you the language that we really... Utah has lovely language when it comes to that. And if huh. you look at the piece of paper that I handed you, that first paragraph under number three, 
no physician, hospital, emergency room personnel, emergency room tech, um, et cetera, in any civil litigation arising out of – will arise for an act of omission of the licensed midwife until it, there's face-to-face -face contact. So that's, that sta for, that's statute probably, huh? SB, yeah, yeah. We so we that, can't no. do that in okay. regs. Okay, it's a whole. So can we get the the um, the the flavor of that in regs in a different language? I don't. I, I maybe that's what you were trying to do in B. Yes, but it doesn't. But if you feel help. like it, to me, it's confusing. Also. If yeah. you feel like we've as, we've fixed the the barrier to physicians being willing to have that consultative relationship. Um, then mm -hmm. B is fine how it is, is it not? I don't, just don't even know what B means. Uh, otherwise, we're going to... A physician and surgeon <laughs> shall be deemed... Yeah, exactly. So anyone that wants to read it will read it, and mm -hmm. they will understand less than mm -hmm. they understand. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the legal system in yeah. California. That's right. right. <laughs> yeah. Is, is there some way of um, restating B where it's... But you should be able to say it even better than I did. Where it's just clear that uh, a physician's legal responsibility doesn't take place until face-to-face -face contact. But, but I thought you said that that's already an understood. I, 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 I think physicians um, would like it restated. If you think it's... I think that there's a fear out there. But isn't that what this says specifically, that they, they do not have a relationship... They do not have a business relationship I'll until they talk to each other face to face. I'll look to my lawyers to answer yeah. that. <laughs> well, if you if you just added that at the end of the sentence, what you just said, right after consulting or accepting referral, the physician doesn't bear responsibility until after he has met and provided care. Is that what you want to say? Sure. I mean, if you, but if I, it, can we I, put in regulations what they do bear responsibility to? I don't. I don't, I don't think we can do so. that. Okay. okay. I don't think we can do that. I can also are, not deem that they. But are that's what we're trying to imply yeah. in section B. Yes. But so we're implying it. No, we're implying we're a business to relationship. To it's apply a, it. It's different. We can't apply it in terms of. Um, uh, we're saying litigation. they don't have a relationship. We're not saying they don't have a legal. We're not talking about anything legal. If they right. just don't. If they haven't had. A, we're not they, saying they don't have liability. Right. However, and we can't. what we're saying, we're talking about what the Utah statute says has to do with um, there is no liability until there is face-to-face -face consult, but here we are directing face-to-face -face consult. I thought we were trying to distinguish between a discrete consultation after which the midwife continues to be the primary care provider from full transfer of care. Yeah. We are, and at this point, we rely on our physicians to document that in their chart, um, and that's the way yeah. we work at this okay. point. Okay. Yeah. We don't want to go there. So, so, it, so with the new words, nothing. Are you comfortable with the new words? Yeah, I, I want to hear it one more time, but I want to. I wanted to ask. So, the way I have it right now is. Um, section A reads, the requirement for physician supervision contained in Section 2507 of the Code is deemed to have been met if the licensed midwife establishes um, a midwife-directed midwife midwife physician-patient consultation, consultation um, for medical indication. Are we... Then the physician must meet the requirements okay. of Section 1379.22. Period, the end of the whole paragraph? I think so. Because mm -hmm. we don't, I mean, the, the consulting once a patient's been transferred, that's already kind of taken care of there because we already have the face to face going on if the patient's been transferred mm -hmm. and the midwife isn't going to resume care unless it's completely appropriate. And then leave section B the way that it is? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. If that's the best you guys can do in, reg in regulation, I guess we'll live with that. Well, what we want is a whole blameless for care not rendered. Can you know? I don't. Yeah. Think, I mean, if we could do, do that, that in regulation, in I'd we love can't to. Do that in regulation. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, we can't. It has to be let. So, all right. So we're happy with this, the way that it is now. Do I need? I'm. Is there a motion on the floor? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, do yeah, I need a new yeah. motion to ex adopt the new language? You have. You already had a motion, so we're it. Hmm. Okay, so I can take a vote. Yeah, I move to accept the new language for section 1379.23. Okay. Right, so now you need public comment. Now need public comment. Okay. Did somebody second? Is there? Oh, yeah, it was first and second. Second, yeah. So is there any public comment on the way we've now 
changed how that's going to read. Maybe we need to read it again just for. Yeah. <coughs> right. Maybe I'll, I'll read it. Sponsor legislation which we now not okay, so the, so the revised language, the proposed language is the requirement for physician supervision contained in section 2507 of the code is deemed to have been met if the licensed midwife establishes a midwife directed physician patient consultation for medical indication period and then it continues the physician must meet the requirement of section 1379.22 for the purpose of that's providing it. No. it stops that's after 1379.22 right okay Okay. So I have public comment. Um, Bruce Ackerman. Thank you. Bruce Ackerman, and I'm just speaking for myself as an interested uh, member of the public. So um, this is just a wording suggestion, but it and I have to say I missed some of the discussion that led to the wording now being thought about. But it sounds to me like the, the first part of this, as it was originally proposed, said that for all of the midwives' clients, the midwife should have the benefit of a relationship with mm -mm. a physician. No. No. It never that. said that. Well, that's, that's what I thought it meant, that yeah, no. for if you are a client and you're coming to the midwife, that you can be assured that the midwife has a relationship with one or more physicians that will allow that midwife to go and ask questions or to send the client to the physician. That's, that's something that the public is getting from this, is to know that the midwife isn't just flying alone and doesn't know anybody who she can even go to if she has a question. So that's what I thought that first thing was saying. And then it was, and then it went on to say what the midwife might do if she decided to consult with the physician. And it, it seemed like that would be the area to change. So maybe after the, in the original wording, after it says section 1379.22, then it would then say for the purpose of a, for the purpose of providing, or, uh, you know, wordsmith it somehow, but for the purpose of the midwife-directed uh, consultation. We, we don't want to possible. direct midwives to have a collaborative relationship for every client. Well, that's what I was, but that's, that's what, what we were discussing earlier. Is that it sounds like the origin, the wording that you're now considering might be read to mean just that. Mm -hmm. that Legal the, is saying it, it isn't being read to mean Okay. Yeah. As long as as long as it's clear that that's that it's not going to get rewritten into a way oh, where it sounds question. like okay. every okay. So I ha I have a suggestion from Ms. Yaroslavsky. Um, I'm going to take the the last comment on this from Jocelyn Grote, and then I'm going to ask if we could get um, someone to type up the language the way it is, and while we take a 10 minute um, break, and then give it back to the council members. So, thank you, Jocelyn. Um, I just have one quick question in terms of the language um, providing guidance and instruction regarding care of women after the transfer has taken place. We're going to mo remove that. And my question in regards to that is, um, is, is there any value to keeping that in the reality, especially as Karen brought up, of mod moderate risk where a doctor might follow a mom for a certain distinct amount of time to determine if she can stay with the midwife or indeed she has to transfer to the, to the doc? There are, in reality, a lot of times where the midwife and doctor have to talk on the phone and is there any and doctor um, you guys can kind of say does this offer protection to the doc doctor that in that phone conversation they no. will be protected no no we, we're not trying to make this offer protection to physicians we're trying to craft it in a way that would make it more likely for physicians to join this kind of a relationship. Once a transfer of care has has happened, mm -hmm. the physician is then responsible and the midwife is no longer caring for the patient mm -hmm. unless the physician then returns that care back to the midwife. In other words, the physician would then have to transfer the care back to the midwife. 
Okay. So. And are there any cases, and maybe the midwives can speak to this, where that transfer has a prolonged time where that's... It can. Right. Okay. Sure. So there's no um, need to protect the phone relationship. There, I guess that's my question. I think what we were hearing from Dr. Gregg and, and Shannon Crawley was that there probably shouldn't be a phone relationship if the physician intends to be protected. And in between practitioners, physician to physician, midwife to physician in a medical setting, mm -hmm. for instance, the kind that I work in, there isn't that phone conversation generally. It's, it's in writing. Right. We, you know, if I want clarification on something that the perinates have told me about a particular client, I'll ask for it, and it, and it will. I may ask for it verbally through a secretary. It'll come back to me in writing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I support this. Can I can I mention that the purpose of this was to carry out the uh, regula regulations for supervision? So it wasn't to do all things for all people under all Correct. circumstances. <laughs> Thank you, Faith. Okay, so we're going to have a 10-minute break while the new language gets written up. We'll meet back. Is there a clock in here, really? No? Do you know what the time is? It is uh, 2.27. Okay, so we'll, we'll reconvene at 20 minutes till 3. Thank you. 13 minutes. We can jog around. Um, I'm going to call the meeting back to order, and as Chair's prerogative, I'd like to announce that um, Frank Cooney left a box of peaches on the back counter. Um, please take some home with you. Um, also, the copies of the new language that we just wordsmithed are on the back counter if you don't already have a copy. You should have a copy. Don't worry. It's okay. All right. Uh, yes, I, oh, I would just like to add the hyphens in that didn't okay. get typed. Okay, hang on just one second. Um, I also was supposed to announce at the beginning of the meeting that, and, and failed to do so, this meeting is being webcasted and will be available through the Medical Board website in about a week. Wonderful. Um, I would just like to um, point out that there, I believe, should be two hyphens. Second line between midwife and directed, there should be a hyphen. And between physician, patient, there should be a hyphen. I think it makes it a slight bit clearer. All right. So has everybody had a chance to read this now? Are there any additional comments from the council? Any additional comments from the public? If I can take a vote now, yeah. So I would call the question. All those in favor? All those in favor of adopting this and sending it onto the full board the way that it stands now? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Good work. <laughs> so what do you want to do with this? Okay. Let's see if we can move on the agenda. Yeah. All right, Ms. Lowe, go ahead. Okay. Sue, so, the second regulation to be discussed is the practice of midwifery drugs and devices, 1379.24 of the California Code of Regulations. And if you could please refer to page 14 of your packets. Oh, sorry. Current regulations address the requirements for midwifery education programs. The education program must prepare the midwife for the management of a normal pregnancy, labor, and delivery. Midwives often face difficulty in securing supplies such as oxygen, anesthetics, and oxytocin in order to practice safely and effectively. At the December 2011 Midwifery Advisory Council meeting, legal counsel presented language for the proposed regulation. The MAC members approved the proposed language with minor edits at the March um, 29, 2012 Interested Parties Workshop. Recommendations were made that language pertaining to diaphragms and cervical caps should be removed from the language of the regulation and requested adding family planning care instead. The specific language is provided on page 15 of your packets and we've updated um, the regulations based on those recommendations. 
Great, thank you. So may I entertain a motion to recommend to the board that the revised regulation for 1379.23, the physician super, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 1379.24, the practice of midwifery, um, be set for hearing. Uh, that way we can have a discussion. So moved. Second. Thank you. So is there any input from the council? Karen? I have two suggestions for small changes. I think instead of postpartum oxytocin, although I realize that is what is in the, the uh, education regulation, that it would be better to say postpartum antihemorrhagics. And then we have local anesthesia and local infiltration, which are essentially the same thing. And I think we should eliminate one of them. <laughs> uh, I would recommend eliminating the local anesthesia. Um, Faith? Uh, that was actually that, that you, use local infil you use local anesthesia to do local infiltration. So we should, and uh, if you, if you remove anesthesia, that is the thing that one purchases as opposed to infiltration, which is a verb. Okay. And Dr. Byrne? A question for, just for clarification, family planning care. Um, there's so many options that are actually invasive, and I'm not sure if this is overly broad. Um, but IUD insertions, okay. Mm -hmm. um, subdermal implants, it, uh, yeah. tubal <laughs> obstruction. Uh I, don't know if there's any our comments. our standard of care um, has an uh, has a section in it that allows the midwife to add skills to her practice if she can obtain physician uh, um, uh, it, if she has appropriate physician backup for instance um, you know if you're working in a clinical setting like I am um, I have physician available if I'm doing an IUD insert, I, I've got that back up. Um, and I, I would think that that would be covered there. That would be covered under family planning. Those two, yeah. those two sound fine, but I'm not sure if this would, could be extended to um, subdermal implants and other more invasive procedures. I, I think it have, could be. that have evolved over the last 10 years. I think it could be extended to that if you used the, um, if the midwife had appropriate training and physician backup for doing it. If, so if you is, did it the, under the that. Question being, the question being raised is, within the parameters of what is said here, do you need to be more uh, definitive in the scope of what, it, what is, is acceptable? Or do you want to add something or, uh, tra or as having been trained? You could say subject to appropriate, appropriate training. Training, training and skill level, something like that. Okay, so I could even re reference. Did you, are you well, finding no, the object being is to not list the subjects to to list the overarching expectation? Right. So appropriate level of training, appropriate backup. When you want to use appropriate something, I was I was thinking maybe we could just reference the section in the standard of care if I could find it. And it, uh, it's, uh, it looks it's like it's section a, section J. Yeah of the midwifery standards of care says the licensed midwife may expand her skill level beyond the core competencies of her training program by incorporating new procedures into the individual midwife's practice that improve care for women and their families. It's the responsibility of the licensed midwife too. And um, one of those is to be able to demonstrate knowledge and competency including um, knowledge of risks, benefits, have a process for acquisition of required skills, identifying and managing complications, and employ employing a process to evaluate outcomes and maintain professional competency, and identify a mechanism to obtaining medical consultation, collaboration, and referral related to each new procedure. So if we referenced Reference, yeah. section, uh, section I and then J, um, it's one. That's like basically in family one. planning care according to Thank you. Section 1, J. Or in accordance with. Yeah. Or as appropriate according to Section 1, J. In, in accordance with. In accordance with. In accordance with. Accordance with. Section 1, J. Is there any more, any other comments from the council members or legal staff? 
Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna preface this by saying, um, and I think this was probably said when the initial discussion of this came about. Um, I'm a little concerned that this seemed to suggest that the midwives are allowed to write prescriptions. No, um, this is, uh, there's a difference between prescription and furnishing. And this, although it does not say furnishing, is in, more in the realm of furnishing. Um, this means that we are authorized to obtain and administer certain, only these specific set of drugs, devices, diagnostics. Okay, so how do they obtain it? Um, we obtain it on, by virtue of our own license, fr usually from some supply house, um, but on occasion from a pharmacy or on occasion from a hospital or from a physician. Those are how we generally do get them. Um, writing of prescriptions is a specific... Um, um, no term right. Wait, there's no prescription. It, it, it doesn't no prescription. say prescription, but what I'm saying is... The concern is the, the underlying meaning, so yes. do you want to put... She'll have the authority to furnish? I think furnishing is, is actually a legal term, as a matter of fact, and yeah. nurse practitioners and, and physician's assistants and what have you have furnishing licenses. So let's and there's nothing, nothing in our law That's true. that authorizes that. But that is essentially what this is. It, it might not use that specific term, but that is essentially what it is, is that we are being authorized here to utilize these things and only these things, not to write prescriptions. But you're not going to be present to explain this to someone reading the rules. So how do we put it into the rules? So the understanding is by the person who is receiving the rule, as well as in 20 years the person who is practicing this profession will know that that term exists. Is it necessary or is it not necessary? I think it's not necessary. You the, think it the, is necessary? The my, my question is, is it legal? <laughs> right. Do we have the authority to write this regulation is my question. Okay. We have the authority based on our education. Here's, here's, here's my problem. I think that the issue that I have would probably be addressed if you replace the word obtain with Furnish. utilize. But, but then but how they, do we obtain how them? How do we obtain them? That's the big it, issue that's right the now. Issue. One of the big issues. But, but, but by regulation, you can't, you can't gain authorization to obtain it by regulation. Right. That's something that you need statute for. Well, part of what is happening is that also the statute doesn't forbid us to obtain, to obtain it. We only have the experience of having the various suppliers of this say that they want some kind of indication that your use of it is legal. Which was, wasn't this the whole discussion that ca brought cause to having this written in the first place was yes. that you were not able to obtain? Yes. yes. So the object, this whole thing was created uh, previously with the, the barrier to performing care by the barrier of not being able to obtain the materials necessary to do whatever you guys do. So, yeah, that, that's correct. My concern all along has been, does the medical board have the authority to grant us the ability to obtain any, any drugs that are normally obtained by prescription? And so we're, that's we're my not, current, that's the current question on the table. Is, we're, we're not doing that. We're definitely not doing that. But we are also... We're giving you the authority to put into law that you can receive the materials that you need to do your job. But we can't obtain them without, without legal authority. That's, right. that's the right. problem right now, is that the, the suppliers right. are saying, show us your DEA license. So no, what I'm <laughs> suggesting is, you, what you're hearing is you need to change the word obtain to something. You're telling me that obtain and furnish are the same things. I don't think that's going to fix it. I think we're going to give you an obstinance license or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, but the reason I asked 
legal about this is no. do we have the ability, the, the current question is, do we have the ability in regulation to grant a practitioner the ability to obtain something that's normally obtained via a, a prescription by someone who has a DEA license? And I'm hearing that no, that's a statute change that needs to happen, not a regulatory change. And this was the whole reason we did this in the first place. Yep. Yes, there was some, some miscommunication along the way about how that was. Okay. Well, what, 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 where did we get the DEA license into this? We are not talking. We would not need a DEA a license, DEA license to is for virtually for any prescription medication. And I, 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 I would just like to put in that um, there certainly has been some legal opinion within the medical board that this is an appropriate regulation. So that's why we're trying to move forward with it. Okay, well, the, just hang on. Okay, okay uh, well, uh, at the risk of being the most unpopular guy in the room, <laughs> uh, which is kind of my habit, here we go. I'll be the second most unpopular. Okay. <laughs> So I think we're really up kind of against a practical limitation is clearly we could promulgate this regulation. And as a person who's been with the medical board for a while, one of the things is that this regulation attempted to reconcile the essentially the educational requirements vis-a-vis -vis -vis the practice requirements because you have, I think, in your regulations and some of your statutes, you have that you'll be trained all that you'll, you'll learn how to use all this stuff, but there's no corresponding um, regulation that says you can use it. So you're trying to, so one of the things I think my former colleague tried to do was try to reconcile those two. That's right. Okay, so I think what we bumped up, I think what we really bumped up against here uh, is kind of a statutory limitation of a practical sense. And that is, my presumption is, I'm not, I don't work for the Board of Pharmacy. I'm not, you know, uh, granted I had some, uh, you know, success in, uh, you know, maybe illicit drugs, but this stuff is not illicit. This stuff is, essentially stuff that requires, in my understanding, a prescription, some sort of ultimate prescription of authority, whether the PAs call that issuing a drug order or a physician calls it writing a prescription. The problem is there's a section in the pharmacy law in the 4040 series that says if a prescription, which is, I understanding, the mechanism by which you will acquire these things, okay, is something that is either signed or issued by a physician, a dentist, an optometrist, a podiatrist, a veterinarian, a naturopathic doctor, a physician assistant, a nurse practitioner, or a certified nurse midwife. Well, guess who's the last one at the dinner table? Uh, yeah. Again, licensed midwife. Licensed midwife. That's yeah. who's not inclusive. So, so how do we that, fix that? You know, that's a statutory change. Uh, what I'm reading for you is for Section 4040 of the Business and Professions Code. That's what I'm talking about. The, lim the practical limitation is we could potentially go ahead and move ahead with this regulation, but the ultimate thing is if you bump up against a pharmacist or a pharmacy, they might not fill it based on this. However, we do have the ability to get these items from supply houses which do supply them to us. And this is partly based on the fact that other states that do have licensed midwifery have formularies. And the formulary drugs are available to that category of practitioner and no other drugs. Well, I, I guess... So I don't, I don't know why that would be different here. See well, I think it's because it's that... What other, the other state formulary to me is, is really irrelevant um, because... In my understanding, it really comes down to whether the pharmacist can fill it, and if they elect not to fill it. What if it, what if it, does, it took the word and you were not allowed to go to a pharmacist to have it filled? I don't know where else you would get this. You would go to supply a supply houses. house. You would go to a medical supply house. For example, oxygen. Getting I, an oxygen. I, I, I want to draw a distinction between oxygen. Well, I don't. You know, I don't think anybody's ever died from an overdose of oxygen. Oh, that's well, but that's not. We're it not, it we're is not technically a, no, a drug. Rogam's going to be a problem. Lidocaine's going to be a problem. Um, vitamin K. Those are all eye prophylaxis. Right. Um, it's All of those are prescription driven. So, I'm. What I'm wondering now is, are these supply houses in compliance with the law, or are they not? They're not run by pharmacists, are they? Do we care if they are in 
compliance with the law or not. Is that that's not our place to decide? If we're looking, if we're looking to fix the problem of midwives getting the, getting surely, what they need, ultimately we need statutory help in this. We have to fix the law. But in the meantime, if anything in here helps midwives in any setting in the state of California to get more of these available to them, I think we should move ahead with this. So let me ask you a question. Could it be that as a stopgap measure, stopgap measure with the expectation <coughs> and assumption of looking for statutory mm -hmm. relief, that as a stopgap measure that you would take out the term drug and put in the term furnish all supplies necessary, such as, and list them as they are here and from a non uh, licensed, I, I don't want to put an unlicensed pharmacy. The object being is that you're not going to, if there's a way of taking the pharmacist out of the picture, you should because that's not where you're getting these materials from. That's correct. I know. But why do we specifically have to take them out? Why can't we be vague? Take what out? The pharmacist. Well, the pharmacist isn't here to start with. Right. We've put them in, but we don't, or her in, we don't want them the in. The word drug in the entire whole. See, I'm saying the word drug connotates oh, pharmacist. The word to me as a as a public person, as a non-medical person, a non-midwife, the term drug to me means um, something to do with pharmacy and pharmacology. Mm -hmm. So if you took the word drug out, and now you might think that vitamin C is, uh, is okay and it's not a drug, I would agree with you. But I don't know about all these other things. Or if, it's, if it's said to obtain and furnish all supplies necessary. Or just, and then just listed immunizing agents, diagnostic yes. tests and mm -hmm. devices, ordered laboratory tests, and includes but is not limited to. Right. So that would be the formulary that is within our scope of practice. Correct. Right. Right. So I'm, I'm saying that I understand that it needs to be a statutory. We have a few statutory fixes. That's but we're sure. like trying to fix this before everyone is um, out of the picture. So I don't know. As a stopgap measure, would that would that be appropriate? So I think we need to hear from legal or yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna. What say you? Okay, so so let me hear the language again. So, so if instead of to obtain and administer in the second just, uh, second line to to obtain and furnish, and then continue the sentence. All supplies necessary. Do we even need all supplies? Well, necessary? no. Okay, you don't need supplies at all. If you just replace administer drugs with furnish. How about that furnish that fine. those items as listed in the educational requirement in the regulations? And ref again, do this by reference to those things that we are required to be trained to do? You know, honestly, I would be much more comfortable leaving the word administer, removing the word drugs. I don't, the word drug bothers me tremendously to obtain and administer, and what did you just say? You said furnish. So. She said furnish, but she likes administer better. I like to obtain and administer immunizing agents, diagnosing, right. and just go on from there. Just so don't just, want the word drug in Just there. get drug out of there. But then just list those right. that would be in the formula. So I'm, I'm fine with the whole thing. Just, just, I mean, if we don't even have to change anything more than that. I'm fine with the it, drug is what bothers me, and drug is what denotes or connotates to me uh, a pharmacy, mm -hmm. which means a... Um, a prescription pad, which uh -huh. you're not going to have. No, we are not. Okay. Well, we we're not in that position to discuss it. Um, if there is any need to reference um, the the Article Five, Section One Three Seven Nine Point Three Zero, is where we are required to be prepared to practice as follows, and it includes. Um, administration of IV fluids, analgesics, postpartum oxytocics, and Rogam uh, monitoring devices, local anesthesia, paracervical blocks, pudendal blocks, that's a joke, um, resuscitation of the newborn, which would include oxygen, administration of vitamin K and eye prophylaxis. That is where it is, if, if we need to reference in this regulation where the authority comes from. It is page 39 in this packet, Article 5, Section 1379.30, bottom corner on the left. <clears throat> that is, and originally, 
Pardon? 1379. 1379.30. 30, right. Yeah. 30. I would put it in. Yeah, I think it should be referenced. It is also interesting to note that this originally was in our law. This was in the enabling legislation. It got moved into regulation. Well, but 1373, 137. 9.30 is already here in the middle of the page. But it's in regulation. It originally was in our law. I'm just saying it's, uh, that's fine, but I'm saying it's already I'm referenced on your page here. Oh, at the there. top. In the You're middle of, about. see it's right oh, here. Oh, I am sorry, I messed it. I kept looking at 2018 and 2507. Yes. Too many numbers. Too many numbers. So it's right there in front of Too me. Too many notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Yes. So leave it as is. Okay. Right here. Yeah. So we're going to remove the word drug. Okay. So we're going to, I think the, the several changes are to remove the word drug, to change oxytocin to antihemorrhagics, to remove local infiltration, and to end that entire paragraph with, and family planning care in accordance with section 1J of the standard of care. Good, good, good. For licensed midwives. Yeah. Are Good. we replacing the word drugs with the list at the end or because I, otherwise no. it doesn't make sense? No. no. But it will just say to obtain and administer. Immunizing agents, diagnostic tests and devices and order laboratory tests as authority includes but it's not limited to. Okay. <coughs> you have to take out the comma as well as the word drug. Mm -hmm. Yes, I apologize. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is there more feedback from council members or legal? Being none. Move to accept the changes. As we have to do public comment first. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, is there any public comment on this um, regulation? Oh, good. Good. So, do we have to withdraw the original? Why don't you, why don't you simply ask if the maker of the motion in the second will, will accept these accept changes? Okay. Uh -huh. will, will the maker of the motion in the second accept these changes? And the seconder also does. Okay. So all, all I might have been the seconder. I don't remember. I think you I were. Think I did, but <laughs> yeah. Were. Okay. Both are. Okay, we're all, both all in all in favor of accepting the changes and submitting it to the regular board uh, to the medical board to um, set for hearing. Say aye. 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 All opposed. Thank you. Right. Okay. Right. So the next item on the agenda is a program update from Ms. Marsh. Agenda item five, the midwifery program update. If you look at the um, closing the mic, Susan, oh. or project a bit. Please. Sorry about that. Uh, licensing statistics, page 16. It's tab five in your packets. And we'll look over the fourth quarter statistics for fiscal year 11-12. There were nine licenses issued with 37 licenses renewed and zero applications pending during the, first, the fourth quarter. Um, the medical board hosted the norm exam on site at the board's offices on August 15th. There were nine individuals who took the exam and the next exam is scheduled for uh, February 15th, 2013. The medical board licensing statistics show as of June 30th, 2012, there were 267 midwives who have current renewed status with 30 in delinquent status. Okay. Um, the delinquency numbers do not include canceled or surrendered revoked licenses. The Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development provided a summary report of the 2011 statistics reported by the California licensed midwives. Of the 283 midwives expected to report, 241 submitted statistics for the 2011 report. 42 midwives have not filed a report. The medical board sent out deficiency letters uh, certified mail on April 19th and 20th 
to as a reminder for the um, uh, that the Elmar statistics were due. Okay, if you look at agenda item uh, 5C, the midwifery program enforcement statistics. During fiscal year 2011-12, July 1 through June 30th, there were a total of 26 complaints received. 20 of those complaints were against licensed midwives. Six were against were against uh, unlicensed midwives. Of the 26 complaints, 17 cases were closed. Do we know if those 17 that were closed, do we know how many of those were licensed and how many unlicensed? Um, I don't have that information. I okay. can get that. Thank you. Okay. Under the investigations, currently there's one case open and Actually, the uh, statistics for the closed cases has been revised to one. It does say three in the report. And two, it could very well be because two cases were reopened. Okay. Two cases were referred to the Attorney General's office with one case referred for criminal action. And we don't know if the case that was referred for criminal action was licensed or unlicensed. I don't have that information at this time. In future, if we could have that okay. information, that would be really wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. It's, re it's really important to us whether it's a, a licensed, a licensee of the board or whether it's a, someone who is unlicensed and a midwife. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions from the council? I would just echo that um, if we're going to be keeping statistics, it's important for us to be consistent with the statistics. So if we have certain statistics for licensed and we have certain statistics the same for unlicensed, we also need to know when you have the totality. Okay. That has to be divided out as well. Okay. Thank you. For, no, no council comments on this. Is there any... Um, Public comment? Okay, great, thank you. So Ms. Lowe will now give us an update on the uh, task force for Ms. There, I, I, there was no comment on what m uh, Ms. Morish um, presented. I do have comments on the licensed midwife annual report. Uh, she, she did present that, but go ahead, Karen. Go for it. Um, I somehow missed that. Um, I have concerns um, because for quite a few months I have been trying to have some kind of contact with OSHPED um, because there are um, ways that I think that we can be getting more accurate data and, and can, that is not happening. I have, I have some information for you on that and I'll share it with you after the meeting. Okay. Um, I would like to state that again, just so that it is clear that some of the data here again doesn't add up where um, people might be looking at um, page 18 in this um, binder, um, section E. Outcomes per county where we have cases of fetal demise and cases of infant deaths that do not correspond to sections O and P where we have um, some listings of fetal and maternal mortalities. Um, and these are, this is why I think we still need to do some revisions on this form as it stands. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Karen, but <coughs> sections N... Um, wait, sections O and P are only talking about live-born infants, are they not, that no. subsequently died? No. If you add these numbers up, they come to seven, and on your report it says five. Or it's just, if they were the right, but, but and look at line number 126, fetal demise diagnosed prior to labor. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. But line 127, this is in section O, 127, fetal demise diagnosed during labor or at delivery. But the numbers don't add. So, so that's these are seven, not and it doesn't add up to what, what's on page 18. I and see what you're saying. Yeah. And then on page 23, where we have complications leading to maternal or infant mortality, those numbers do not compute with section E. So there's a problem here that I think we really need to address because we're getting clearly inaccurate information. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a big, it's a bigger discussion than we have time for today. But thank you. All right. 
Okay. Now, Ms. Lowe. <laughs> So very briefly, an update on the task force for midwifery students and the midwife assistants. At the March 29, 2012 MAC meeting, it was recommended that a task force to assist in determining regulations for midwife assistants and student midwives be organized. The task force has been scheduled for September 13, 2012 and will be held here at the medical board headquarters. Um, staff is currently in the process of notifying the public of this meeting and inviting all who may be interested in attending as participants of the public. Um, we will be providing notification on the board's website. Um, the agenda will be posted today. And we'll also be sending letters out to all licensed midwives um, in California. The goal of the meeting will be to discuss apprenticeship model and the issue has become um, an increasing concern for those who have been assistants for years whose role is now under scrutiny. And that concludes my update. Thank you. Is there any comment from members? I just had a question and that is that w um, I would assume that the model for um, student assistance or practical training on the job training exists in other states. And if part of that, part of your information may be gleaned from other states as to what they do in the process that they follow, um, it, it might be interesting as far as bringing a fuller picture to the table. We'll be providing different reference material that we can Good. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I at one time volunteered for it to be on that task force, but I've not heard from the medical board, so I'm assuming I'm not. You are on the task force. I are. Board. You're oh. there. It would be nice to know about. They just decided. Okay. I thought you got the email that I got, so maybe you didn't. Okay. But yes, the 13th, 1 to 4. We can discuss the members of the task force after with you if you'd like. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Is there any public comment on um, this agenda item? Seeing none, I'll move on to the next agenda item. Uh, consideration of an Azoni Institute advanced placement and transfer credit proposal, Mr. Warden. Okay. Um, at this time, uh, I've, Ms. Lowe and I discovered a, um, an issue that we need to re search further for the Nazoni Institute before we make this recommendation that we were going to make today. Um, so uh, based on the additional information that we had done, um, it appears we may have overlooked something in our initial review and we need to further clarify some of that so there will be no recommendation today for the map. Great, thank you. Is there any questions from the council? Any public comment? Seeing none, we'll move forward. Thank you. So agenda item eight is a discussion and possible recommendation to the full board on MAC term limits. Um, I asked um, staff to put this on our agenda because I think it's, it's really important as we move forward as a, as a committee of the medical board to construct boundaries surrounding the length of time that individuals will participate on the council. Um, I believe that the public is best served um, by allowing a rollover of interested individuals to give their guidance via this council and input on the needs of midwives and birthing families in the state. Uh, I would like to suggest that we adopt term limits of two complete three-year terms per member. And um, I'd also like to have a little bit of discussion around what, what is our length of term for chair and vice chair because we've never really had that discussion and when I asked staff about it they kind of didn't really know either so um, I think that I th it would be I think advisable for us to, to have something that was sort of part of our, our regulations here. Um, I'd like to entertain discussion on this idea. So you're, suge uh, you're suggesting two three-year terms? Is that what you're suggesting? That's the six two years? full three, yeah. So it's six years? Yeah, six years or uh, some of us started like with a one-year term or a two-year two term. term. And so, so the terms now are three years each. So I'm suggesting after you've served two full three-year terms that that, that would, would terminate it. Um, I, I also know that did some in some situations there's you can serve two consecutive terms and then after an interim of a certain amount of time then you're eligible to serve further. So I, I think we could also discuss that as well. 
Do we need a motion in order to have discussion? At this point, I'd give this a sort of free form. I think you'd be we can. Go ahead and okay. Um, I just, I am of a, I'm, I'm of two minds on this. Um, and this isn't about me, um, because I am planning on the three-year term that I am in being my final one. I do not intend to um, apply again. Um, so I, I'm not talking about me. Uh, what I do see, though, is we have term limits in our legislature, and it was for exactly the kind of reasons that Carrie uh, mentioned here, that we have those term limits. There are some things about that that work well, and there are others that just don't. One of the things that doesn't work well about that is um, loss of institutional memory. Um, and I, I don't know how to deal with that exactly, um, but I know that it can be really important to have historians present on, in the deliberations who really have a long, solid uh, knowledge of how things have been happening and how um, decisions have been made. So I don't know what to say, and I don't even know how I'm going to vote. In addressing that, I, I thought a lot about that, and, and, and I agree with you, you're, you're correct. I think that particularly this council is really good at hearing from the public. And so the institutional memory could come that way. Additionally, the terms don't all expire at once. So, for instance, you're good till 2015, and I think, Faith, you're done next year if, if we adopt this, and I'm good till, till the 2014. The listing that's here is not completely Yeah, it's not accurate. correct. Yeah. Um, so, so there's that kind of a rollover. I would hate to see, you know, uh, the entire MAC term out at the same time and then and then be replaced with people that didn't didn't have that institutional memory um, but I also think that fresh blood if you will is not a bad thing um, we can um, we can get into a pace I think when we are um, on a board of any of any type where we um, well, it's always been that, done that way, so it should always be done that way. And so then there's no, there's no opportunity then for new people to come in with new and fresh ideas. Did you have something you wanted to add, Faith? Well, I, I'm, I would be, this would be my last, my next to last meeting. Uh, I, my term is up uh, um, in March of 2013, which is not what it says on that yeah. paper, but that's what's actually the case. Yeah, I, I realized that when I finally got the packet and actually looked at it. Could there be an exception for people who are members now? To that it would only apply to people who, um, you know, are appointed beyond this date. I don't think that solves the problem. Term limits are, are, in my opinion, the worst thing that can ever happen to de uh, d democracy. I mean, d if you want to cause the downfall of democracy, you institute term limits and forget about institutional memory. You just do it. I think the issue here, though, is not about um, term limits and, and democracy. The issue is about engagement of the community, the broader community of participatory individuals um, to have some give and take and to have some opportunities to be engaged at a level that's more than their day-to-day -day level of engagement with uh, a governing body. So to that extent, I'm not sure why you got rid of the, or not you, but it was gotten rid of, of the two-year terms or the three-year terms or how we went from two to three. I'm not no, quite sure. It, but no, it, no, no. They staggered it that way in the first place so that we wouldn't all, there are, so our terms all wouldn't three expire terms. at the same time. So there, I understand that, but there are, they're all three-year terms, yes. but they weren't all three-year terms before. No, that was correct. Because I think the the initial, that was to create okay, the stagnation. So now we have a stagnation of half is on the even year and half is on an odd year, which I think is a good idea because you don't want to, to lose that insti that that also gives you institutional memory, um, but I look at Miss Greg, uh, Dr. Greg, excuse me, who sits in our audience today and who participated uh, here at the table, who is was here from the beginning, really the beginning of this this um, of the MAC, and I thank her for her service, and I obviously she's concerned and and and, and shows up. I don't know how you do it. Um, I'm not sure that you um, you go to a six year max situation. That you go to a I think it's important for you to have change and for you to have turnover, and it's not to do for anything other than 
Um, you might have ex officio members that can that can mm -hmm. come and participate and not vote and sit there. You can ask people to chair uh, uh, sidebar kinds of uh, opportunities where you have a need for more information or uh, we call it task force or whatever you might want to call it. Um, if the purpose is to get a variety of opinions at the table and a variety of opportunities to participate, then you institute change. So um, I don't know that this is a, a democracy of sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't know how you want to do it. But I mean, if you want to, um, I mean, this is like bylaws, which mm -hmm. we don't have here. Right. But this is like a bylaws rule change. So our legal uh, team should start putting some words here. Your mic. Now I have two mics. Um, so I think the issue is, uh, not the issue, but the, there's, a, there's a couple unique things. Number one is that this is a, these members here are sort of appointed by the board. And the other thing is is that there's no set statutory limit on the number of members, which is unusual because in the board setting, you know, it's you have a certain, the legislature speaks and says 13 members and half shall be this and one shall be appointed from here. We don't have that. All we have is the, is the one half licensed midwife. So um, theoretically, this August body could expand and contract as the medical board sees fit, which would, if you want to talk about new blood, that would be, the, I th you know, speaking from a purely legal perspective, that would be the mechanism Wait a minute, is that an IV? Sorry, going back to the last thing there. I'm so. not going to a pharmacist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right. That's fine. So that, that's, those are my two cents for from the legal, from the statutory restriction standpoint. So if I'm understanding you right, you would suggest rather than imposing term limits, that maybe we go to the board and say we'd like to have a couple new members? No, not at all. What I'm, I'm not making any policy session. What I'm session is, is that just merely pointing out there's no limit. We're not bumping up against, you know, once we get to 9, once we get to 11, that's it. We can't have any more. All I'm suggesting is the simple fact that there is no limit on the number of slots. So you could expand and contract. If this August body thought they needed essentially new input, new blood, whatever, besides, the, as Ms. White pointed out, besides the task force and the committees and the interested party meetings, if, they, if this body thought there was a, a demonstrable need to have more members or fewer members, you could certainly make that request to the board. And you could get expansion as contraction as you saw fit, as the board saw fit. I'm not sure what we're trying to achieve, so um, it would be helpful if I, if I understood that, then I could comment, but I'll comment anyway. Um, <laughs> it seems to me that um, not knowing where we're trying to go, I, I think that increasing the size of the board is a good idea for new members uh, to, like to get some new idea. people. I also think the idea of having ex officio members um, that want to be involved, and I'm not sure where to place them, but or... or to appoint some kind of um, other kinds of committees that are subcommittees of this. So if it's investigation into, we have a great staff here who has the opportunity because of their leadership to um, be able to check out everything you need checked out. Maybe you want to put some some warm volunteers to that opportunity to help support the staff. I'm not sure. I'm not telling staff how to work their jobs, but I'm just, and I'm not. I'm not trying to go down that path, but by the same token, if it was that you had people that were interested in being participatory, but you didn't have a place for them, it may be that staff would find it uh, not a challenge, but uh, a help to have people starting to do research, let's say, or culmination of information from different other resources nationally or internationally. You give people jobs to do, and it's amazing how people step up to the plate to, to have it done, and staff has only a finite amount of hours to spend in a day working on your stuff here. So, And this is not the primary, no offense, this isn't the only thing the medical board is doing. Yeah, so um, <laughs> to that extent, our staff is stretched, and we are, lo uh, you know, with the um, workload of the, of the medical board, our staff is stretched, and, and they put in more than their expected participation. I mean, they're all wonderful and they all are really working very hard. So that, I think that as the chair, you might want to meet with staff and, and see and with legal and see where you want to go because this is kind of like you're in charge this year. You get to kind of, uh, in my opinion, you're kind of in charge. So um, I don't make those rules either. But um, I, think, I think what I'm looking for is more participation from public and other midwives without losing 
the the wonderful history that that we have here on the council because that's invaluable and I didn't realize that we could expand contract or whatever um, by request and so maybe that's a better way to go I'm wondering what other people are thinking down at the end of the table <laughs> I think I would in general prefer to leave it looser rather than tighter that, that makes sense so so does that mean that you don't that you do like the idea of per perhaps asking to add a couple of members if we felt like that was a good idea I if already did was, yeah <laughs> Yeah, you so did. <laughs> I think that the perspective, and I think for the people sitting in the audience and for the people that are watching, need to understand that this is considered a, a conversation between this MAC that we're not allowed to have in private, that this has got to be done in an open forum so that the public can participate, and by the same token, we're not allowed to have a meeting that's not noticed. It has to be a public meeting. So that they're having this conversation that sounds very stilted and very, we're not sure what we're doing or why we're doing it, it's exactly that we do not know what we're doing or why we're doing except that we need to do something and having that kind of public discourse is is the system that we live under with the open meetings acts or whatever we're doing whichever act we're acting under okay okay so okay so I what I'm hearing is that we don't want to move forward with setting term limits for the actual council okay so the second question then is I would really like to know how long the term of chair is supposed to last. <laughs> um, I have a little bit of a personal investment in that right now. And I'm feeling, it seemed like, Faith, when you were initially elected as the, as the chair, it seems like you did it for a couple of years without it ever coming up for issue again. But then I it seemed like with you, Karen, maybe we voted again after a year and a half. And so I feel like it's kind of been a little loosey-goosey and I'd just like to know what's expected of me so I, I think the first time as chair to begin with none of us knew what we were doing and things just happened <laughs> I, I, would, I wouldn't use that as a benchmark for much of anything other than you know when you do something the first time you kind of fall around try to figure out what you're doing and there was one time in the middle of face term that we did vote on yeah, continuing we, yeah yeah I, I, you're right we did yeah I remember so I, I don't remember I'll take your word for it <laughs> no we re-elected you at some point okay. yeah um, and that was that's because staff. Call selective memory not that's institutional right. memory okay. that's because staff came and said you you're due for an election right but yeah. when I talked to staff today they weren't really sure what where that was written so um, <laughs> I would I feel like two years is a is a decent bit mm -hmm. since we're only meeting three times a year that, that getting into it in okay I've now chaired two meetings and I'm only going to do one more and then we're going to vote again seems a little soon and since both of you have already chaired this council I'm wondering what you think about that I think we should have uh, reelect you for a second term so so you're wanting to do one year or, do, or, or stipulate the two years as two, I mean, either one. I mean, we, we could do either one. It, each would be and fine I, with me. I would say that having done one year and one meeting, it did seem short. It yeah. did seem like it was cut, cut quickly. Um, and I think that two years is reasonable. Yeah, it, it, it's hard to figure out what you're doing to yeah. begin with. I, I yeah. want you to know. I had no idea about Robert's Rules of Order or any of that stuff. So. <laughs> Okay, so, so I would recommend that you give this some serious consideration and some serious thought and talk with staff and come back with your recommendation of what you want well, to happen. I, I, I actually have a recommendation. Good, then the, oh, that's very good <laughs> thinking so, on the job. I'm impressed. <laughs> so I would like to make a motion only regarding the, the officers of this council to serve two two-year terms and could be reelected ad nauseum I suppose um, <laughs> without without term and in delete the um, the requirement for term limits um, with with the you know knowledge that if we decided we wanted to have 
a larger council, we could ask the board to appoint several new members. And so, so that's my motion. That, that we not adopt term limits. We're just ignored. That we not have term limits and that we, that we have a two-year term for officers. Then I would say that your motion is that we have two-year terms for officers. Okay. Forget the other part because we didn't have a motion. Great. So are you going to second that? Sure. <laughs> so that you're going to have always an incumbent. Yes. No. Yeah. Just, yeah. Okay. So now public comment on this. Barbara, so, I don't understand what you mean by that. So that means you're always going to have that the people <gasps> that sit around this table today are going to be the same people that are going to sit around the table in 10 years unless as an incumbent someone runs against them, which is fine. No, I, I, my intention on this motion is that we have elections every two years. Right. For the officers, and that we're just not going to do For term limits. Officers. We're tabling term limits again. You're going to hear in about 10 seconds. Oh, no, it's, a, it's a item number eight. You're fine. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's fine. So, so the motion is that we set terms for the officers of two years. And Karen has seconded it. Is there public comment? Seeing none. Huh? I'm sorry. I, just, I kind of have a, just kind of a. Thank you. Um, so you just did, in my experience, have we ever, for example, let me back up. So we do have for the medical board, we're going to, we're going to, the board shall elect a president, a vice president, and a secretary. And so do we, I'm just trying to think of, do we, at this point in time, do you just want to limit the terms of the chairperson or do you want to, is it more appropriate, and I'm just throwing this out there, that you sort of uh, figure out who we're going to, who you want to elect, because uh, I don't know if we ever elected a vice, this body has ever elected a vice chair. Yeah, yeah I met okay. him. Okay. <laughs> Must have been absent that day. Um, <laughs> We've always had a vice chair. It was chair. Ruth Haskins. Ruth okay. Haskins was the vice chair. Yeah. Okay, and so I'm, I'm just curious whether, whether, because there is some, in my mind, there's a little bit of tension between where we started on the agenda item, which was term limits, and now we sort of morphed into sort of the the the, the length of term for an officer. Well, no, I put no, it, we all, it was all together. It was a it was a total discussion of that. As I, okay. it's right here in my notes. I okay. said as part of the term limit thing, I wanted to discuss what the term for officers was. So are we, are we okay, Kurt? Just frame it within the perspective of what you've got on your agenda is all you have to do. Right. Okay, so we discussed term limits. We've now set a term limit for the officers of two years right. with no terming out. Then that's it's not a term a limit. We've just set a term. <sighs> yes. Mm. You do that. Okay. I said, she you're has making to no, go no by the limit on the agenda. term you may serve as a MAC member. <laughs> what you're trying to limit right. is the term you serve as, as an officer. officer of I'm, I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to say what is the term? How long is it supposed to last? Is it? The term of the president is, is two, years. two years. Is it what? What is it? Because that has never been discussed or set before. Chair. Right. So you were trying to frame this in terms of the agenda item. Right. She's right. just trying right. to get it into yes. item right. Eight. So she's so have got I? to talk on. So I think that statement is fine. You have discussed term limits. I mean, that's what was agendized. Okay. You've come to a decision that there will not be term limits for the general MAC membership. However, you've decided that you want to recommend a two-year term for officers. Correct. Okay. I, I, I think, think the word election the, I think for the election the of agenda officers. Item. Okay. Is, is, in other words, you're not, we're re-electing. We could re-elect right, you right. in two years exactly. if we wanted to. Okay. Exactly. All right. Still no public comment? No, so let's move on the motion. Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. The motion carries. So item number nine is agenda items for the December 6th 
um, Midwifery Advisory Council meeting. Um, we're going to have addition. Uh, we're going to have updates on the midwifery program statistics, which is kind of a standard. Um, we'll have an update on the midwifery um, students and assistance task force, which is going to take place in a couple of weeks. Um, and an update on the task force, which has not been set as to time yet, to look at the feasibility of using the MANA statistics interface. So those are those are my items. We haven't started it yet. So uh, do I have any other agenda items from anybody on the uh, council? I uh, still am concerned about the uh, the E and N P differences. Can we find out some more information? How 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 can we? I mean, that's a relatively easy thing to do by the relative to the computer entry part, and I don't understand why we're not able to get the right data. Mr. Warden, would you? Can you help us with that, please? Thank you. Are we proposing that as an agenda item to review the data? Let, that's what, yeah, that's Doctor, what I'm Doctor, proposing. Dr. Warden, or Mr. Warden can let us know what, he can update you on where we're at with that. Okay. Okay, so to make any changes to the report as it is, we have to get those approved by OSHPED, and our ISB staff have to do it. Okay. Right now, the ISB staff is at a point where they don't have the time to work on that, and we need to have a full understanding of exactly how what is wanting to be changed and how it's going to be changed so it actually works correctly, and we need to spend some time with Ms. Um, early uh, with her she's provided us some s information I don't know if I totally understand it but once I uh, understand it um, board staff will go to Oshped to request that and we have to work through that so based on our current workload with what's going on with the board I haven't had the opportunity to do that yet so we, we are up for our annual reports and our um, sunset review, and um, we just are a little, and we're also in the process of getting a new, possibly, we're in the process of trying to get a new computer system for us, for the board here, which is taking a lot of ISB time, and a lot of my staff's time, and a lot of enforcement staff time. But so once we get to that, which I think will be a little closer to that, a little bit later within the next month, or maybe two, then we can focus on trying to get to that. Some of these changes. I thank you for the explanation. I believe me, ha having sat at the medical board meetings, most all of them for years, I understand how impacted you folks are. And I appreciate that you work way more than full time. Oh, no, I, I just pretend to be here. <laughs> so I, I, I'm sorry if you felt at all harassed by this, but um, no. it does seem important to me. And no, I no, it's not that it's not important. I'm just prioritizing so, yeah oh, I have yeah. a I have a question if changes are going to get made <clears throat> does it have to come back to us what the changes are and then go to the full board or can it just be done with staff um, I'll have to check into that for you okay because I, really, I was hoping I, to get something changed for the next reporting year and now we're kind of like up against not, that and it's uh, not, it's uh, not, it's not, not I don't happen. think that's gonna happen yeah yeah okay I, I also thought that the changes we're talking about had already been agreed on, that E and P had the match, and they don't. Yeah, but I believe that's how the questions are worded and how people enter the data. Well, that's, right. I, see, but I, I, the idea that I have is a way of making sure that the question only gets asked once, so that I, there is I, no double I reporting of that, stuff. But we have yeah. OSHPED requirements, and yeah. I want... We can't always it's make It's a state everything. entity, Karen. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. It's government. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank All right. you. So given that explanation, is there still something regarding that that you want on the agenda for December? Uh, well, here's the deal is if we don't put it on, then we can't talk about it. If we do put it on and the problem is being handled, then we can just go on. Okay. Blow by. So, so we're going to ask for an update from staff on on mm -hmm. um, changes to the LMAR form Could, on the EP problem. Can I ask for uh, uh, even a more basic agenda item, perhaps an overview sure. of the goals and operations of the data reporting processes, and then you know that could help give additional context to evaluate. That'd are be we great. meeting our goals and objectives? Are there operational hurdles, budgetary hurdles, or others? Super. Thank Excellent. you. Great. 
All right. So is there any additional comment on the that last item, public or MAC members? Super. All right. No further public comment or MAC business. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. And we're early. Yeah. That's a